Let me call to order the March 6, 2024 meeting, committee of the whole meeting of the Pottstown Borough Council. Would you rise for a moment of silence, followed by the pledge to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> okay, before I get started on uh, the agenda, uh, we have a guest here tonight. Uh, we're being visited by a commissioner from Montgomery County. Uh, would you welcome the remarks of Thomas DeBella? Yeah. Good evening. Oh, <laughs> I talk loud, sorry. <laughs> Go for it. Uh, I just want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to, to come to your meeting this evening and just say hi. As mentioned, I'm Montgomery County Commissioner Tom DeBello. What I've been doing, uh, I, I was sworn in in January, and, and my goal is I'm moving, going around to a lot of different communities and municipalities to just introduce myself um, and, and talk about that. Um, I'm really excited to be in the role that I'm in. I'm out there. I'm available to talk with anybody working through a lot of issues in Montgomery County. More importantly, I live in Limerick Township, so Western Montgomery County is really a, a good place for me. Um, Western Montgomery County hasn't had good representation from the county for, for years, and my goal is to be here in Western Montgomery County as a representative of the county, as a county commissioner, obviously, and, and work with you and see what we could do together to, to help uh, not only build up Pottstown, but Western Montgomery County as a whole. Uh, so I'm really excited to be here. Um, issues that I'm working on, I've, I've, it's across the board. From the from financial, from uh, working with the police and, and the crime, but most importantly, one of the big issues that I'm I'm really spearheading is dealing with the homeless issues that we see throughout the county and what we see within Montgomery County, uh, within Pottstown. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, you know, the goal is is to I, I, I'm working with uh, the county HHS and uh, uh, Health and Human Services. And we really want to put a plan in place. There's a lot of different organizations that are out there doing a lot of wonderful things for our, the homeless. Uh, but what we need to do is take it a step further and say, okay, how are we going to, within two to three or four years, whatever it may take, to have real solid programs in place that will, will get us to a point where we see no or, or reduce the homeless situation across the county. Uh, so uh, we have, there's a lot of good things that we're planning. I uh, hope to see come to fruition uh, within by summer. Uh, but I have, I've been setting up a lot of meetings throughout the county. I've come up and talked with people in Pottstown as well. Um, I've actually talked with some of you, as, and I'd like to reach out and, and, and talk with all of the borough council when, when you have the opportunity even to meet with the mayor. Uh, because I think there's really important things that we could do together, and that's what this is all about. Um, and, and really uh, strive towards lifting up not only uh, all the aspects of Montgomery County, but Western Montgomery County as a whole. So that's my goal. Uh, I am available. My phone, my office is always open. So please, if you have any issues, ideas, questions, suggestions, whatever it may be, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, we, the other two commissioners, we, we uh, got sworn in together in January. We're having a really good relationship. We're working well, working hard together. It's a change in Montgomery County, which we're really happy about, where we have three county commissioners that are, that are driven towards uh, addressing all the major issues. We agree on probably 90% of everything that comes in front of us, which is really great from a county commissioner standpoint. Uh, I encourage people to come to our meetings. Uh, they're the second and fourth uh, Thursday. Uh, the, count, there's, they're up, the meetings are on the calendar, so please come to our meetings. Uh, raise up any issues, concerns, or ideas as well. Again, this is a good thing for Montgomery County that all three of us are working very well together, and I'm sure we'll all be out to uh, different events in Pottstown as well. So again, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to just come out and say hi and introduce myself. I don't know if anybody has any quick questions. Anyone? Hearing none? All right, great. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming out. 
Okay, uh, I'd like to start with a presentation to a retiree. Uh, yes, um, so first uh, I'd like to recognize Alan Britton. Um, fortunately, I don't think he, I don't see him here tonight. I don't think he was uh, able to make it. Um, but we do have a resolution for him that he can pick up um, when he's available. Um, Alan has served us for 48 years. Um, you know, he started out way back when the, when the borough actually uh, managed its own trash uh, system. So um, that's where he started out. Um, and uh, he was a refuse collector. Then he worked uh, for 34 years as a service for worker one in the streets division of public works. And uh, he helped maintain all the streets and the, and the alleys. Um, so, you know, we'll really miss Alan. Um, we're glad to see him uh, go on to uh, different uh, uh, things that he can now focus on in, in his retired life. So um, just want to thank him. And uh, as I always say, you know, um, we really appreciate our employees, especially ones that have demonstrated dedication like this for almost half a decade. Uh, from infrastructure, Councillor Lebedinsky. Yeah, we, uh, for February's meeting, we were talking about the uh, documentation that had been mostly manual at one point in time is now mostly digital. Um, and with the use of express bill pay, we started out with the trash uh, payments and water utilities payments, and now we've now moved to, I think over the last couple of years, we're doing um, in our uh, property taxes now. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to expand to include more, if not all, options, um, and all online, and the forms are already online as needed. Uh, we're moving to direct pay, having um, the ACH ability, and I may have talked about that last month, but we're one step closer for that. Our launch is expected by the first quarter of this year. Um, with our long-term goals, we are set for um, the water and sewer utilities to be monitored and controlled uh, and from a central uh, utility area. And um, we're looking to also uh, streamline and automate that process. So, there you go. Uh, what we want to do, I think, next month, and I talked to you, Dan, about it, is to get the uh, fire chief in, in and uh, talk about his uh, uh, concerns about the fire department and what we can do. It was for methods. Oh, this was it. All right, I switched it. Sorry. Okay, so that was the methods report. <laughs> Infrastructure's in your pack. <laughs> God. <laughs> okay. Sorry. And ordinance review, Councilor Prosser. That's all. That's all right. Economic development, Ms. Lee Clark. Good evening, councilors, Madam Mayor. Uh, so a lot is going on right now. Um, I hope you're also noticing that we are continuing the lighting project. So the Edison bulbs, there were several installed on the 400 block, as well as there are some on the 300 block now, and we will continue to fill in as we can get owners online to work with us. Um, plants, unfortunately, the weather has uh, delayed that. They were supposed to be in on Monday, but through the generosity of a Walmart grant to paid, we will be able to have a winter spring planting until the beautiful flowers that Park provides every year are available. So uh, those will be going in and uh, we'll fill those empty planters now that all of the holiday decorations are gone. Um, small business grants, again, through a generous grant through Univest Bank, we are able to accept applications for micro grants. It's not a lot of money. It is for small businesses with brick and mortar locations, five employees or yet less. Uh, instructions are on Paid's website. We've already gotten quite a th few. Um, we don't want to really disappoint anybody. Uh, there will be nobody from paid that will be reviewing them. We have some volunteers from the community that will be reviewing those um, grant applications and then recommending the awards. Uh, the good news is we just got notification today. I'm not ready to disclose who this grant will come, but we will be able to offer another round of these small business micro grants. Good. So we continue to look for these opportunities. We know post COVID that a lot of our small businesses, you know, money was flowing during those days and now it's not flowing so much. So we know that they're really, um, they, they really are in challenging places. There is a lot going on in the downtown. You will be noticing 
seeing a lot of movement throughout the grooming room is now moving off one of the streets further past King and moving into the downtown space. There also will be an Italian bakery coming to the downtown uh, from another area. I know that most people have seen the Artillery uh, Brewing, which is a brewing company that is not a new brewing company. It is from Westchester, so they have other locations. Uh, Gazos will be here. I know they sell out all the time. They're keeping everybody up to date. Mm -hmm. uh, the latest is because of um, a blip in natural gas. We have been in touch. Um, it's about the service into that building. So they're working through that, but that's going to delay. That is going to delay. Um, remember, one of the things that I consistently remind people about development in the borough of Pottstown is everything always takes longer than expected. Um, but it's worth the wait. Uh, we have many, many things happening. There's a business called The Collective that will be coming in. And then we have some larger projects, which uh, you're going to hopefully hear from. I just want to say that Dwight City Group has been a wonderful group to work with. They're very responsive. Mm -hmm. And I hope that you will consider uh, to do everything you possibly can to make sure that a much needed type of development will be started in this borough. Um, Right, we are always talking about, and that leads me into, uh, <laughs> I was able to see their property. I was there with Councillor Proxel. It was amazing. We kind of hit it at dark. It was all lit up. It was a very bright and clean building. It was really a fantastic space. So we were able to see those spaces, and I feel confident that they are responsible developers and just the type of development that could make a real difference here in this borough. Um, which leads me to what's going on in downtown. So, right, remember when nobody wanted to come to Pottstown ever. Everybody wants to come to Pottstown ever. I want to be really clear about we want to work with the businesses, the businesses that have invested here in the downtown. We certainly are not wanting to hurt them in any way, shape, or form. So PAID has historically put in the paperwork on behalf of Red Horse Motoring Club. That is where it stops. All we are doing is getting paperwork. This year, for the first time, we were asked to gather signatures. We put it out. Mia culpa. We should have been clearer because there are multiple things that we were getting signatures trying to be efficient. We did not notify the businesses of the exact start times and the exact amount of closures. Mm -hmm. So there's somebody here from Red Horse that can talk today about that, but I just want to be really clear that we are balancing and we are hearing the business community, the theater, that is very important to the, the vibrancy of downtown. So we're all working. The good news is to take me back to Dwight, if you have people that already live in the borough, then it's a lot less impactful to those businesses if they can walk to those businesses. Mm -hmm. So just something else to think about. It's all part of the ecosystem, right? Mm -hmm. um, festivities, talking about downtown. Paid does have an application in. I want to be really clear that that is just a placeholder. I don't want any confusion. I know go forth refers to their wonderful celebration on 4th of July that has been moved into the downtown as Street Fest. Um, that is just a placeholder to get it in for your approval. The reality really is that that is a small space. It's just the 200 block. Uh, it stops at Char Hanover to Charlotte. That's what the closure is being asked for, and that will that is coming up from the business community. So that is why paid is putting in that paperwork promises to be a great day, cornhole tournaments, bands, et cetera, the type of thing that will be uh, exciting to the downtown community. I feel like I am going to miss something. I am really sorry if I do, um, but the last thing that I want to say is I know you have another zoning application, 1501, for a food truck, which looks like a business that is trying to be a permanent food service business in the Eastern Gateway. We have a lot of food service businesses out there. We have plenty of brick and mortar spaces. I'm not saying I'm against food trucks. Food trucks are appropriate in the right places, but I don't believe that it belongs in the Eastern Gateway as a permanent place when we have all of these other buildings. 
that is an opportunity, and people go through that development. That is my report for economic development. If I miss something, please feel free to ask me questions, and you all have my email, I think. Okay. And from the land, land bank. bank. <clears throat> Much shorter. 403 <laughs> Walnut was awarded by the land bank. Uh, it's been chosen to be sold. There's an agreement of sales to finding property solutions. Um, when they were scored, they scored a 90 and out of 90 on their application, so there really wasn't any question. There were a total of three applicants. That was certainly, um, without a doubt, the one that seemed to be the best fit for that particular property. I've been getting a lot of questions on how do we get on the land banks list to be able to put in applications for properties. Um, that is located on the Pottstown Borough land bank website, there is a link that is a pre-screening application. That's not an application for a property, it just gets you into queue, and then we are able to send you direct correspondence when properties become available. Okay. That is my report. Thank you. Human relations, is Levin good? Councilors, Madam Mayor, <laughs> Council President, that coat has been following me all day today. It's been a little joke at work, too. Um, March is Women's History Month. Um, it's where we can celebrate the contributions of women who have, have made, um, who've made a difference in our history, culture, and our society. Um, Ramadan begins on March the 11th. This is a month-long celebration when the Muslims uh, participate in fasting, prayer, giving, and self-evaluation. Um, it's also Irish American Heritage Month to honor the achievements and contributions of Irish immigrants and their descendants living in the U.S. It coincides with St. Patrick's Day, which is March the 17th, which is the, na the Irish national holiday. Um, the first day of spring, is March the 19th. Daylight Savings Times begins March 10th, which is this weekend. And the oldest, uh, the celebration of the Christian Church, Easter, is actually on Sunday, March the 31st. So um, the Commission's um, next meeting, uh, March meeting, will be held on Tuesday, March the 12th at 6 p.m. in Council Chambers, and all are welcome to attend. Thank you. Thank you. And from the library, is Mindy up there? Ah, oh, there you are. Ah, Hi. You're hiding behind our <laughs> commissioner. <here. laughs> yes, <clears throat> behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, good evening, everyone. Um, you have received a report in your packet there. Um, that's a, a statistical report that my executive assistant and I are working on to try and get out to you guys ahead of time so that you can see the statistics, so I don't have to bore you with that tonight. So I just have a couple of things I wanted to share. I'm in the process of doing our annual report with the state, and I was delighted to see in 2023 that our programming um, more than doubled. We had offered 896 programs for the Pottstown community in 2023. So that was really exciting when I saw that. Yes. And... Um, just a fun fact, um, the library originally was started by a group of women called the Century Club in the, in the early 1900s, and they literally went door to door and asked for books, hmm. for people to donate books that they, that, that's how it all started. So we are um, gonna be starting an initiative called the Second Century Club, or we haven't decided if we're gonna call it the Second Century Club, which is my choice, <laughs> or the next 100 years, because we are celebrating 103 years in April. Mm. So stay tuned for the information on that. And just uh, one little tip for the community, uh, passport photos. We are a, an authorized passport acceptance facility. Um, we are get noticing that people who are getting their passport photos from non-passport acceptance agencies are getting rejected. And the wait time for passports in March typically extends beyond 10 to 18 weeks. 
for processing time. So if you need a passport photo, but you don't need us to process your paperwork, you can still come to the library and get your photo taken by a passport trained agent. So you'll have a higher likely chance of those photos passing through the federal government. So um, feel free to uh, contact the library and we'll be able to take care of those photos for you. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, and from the Ricketts Center, Joe, have you anything to add? Yes. Um, let me see here. Okay, there's quite a few activities going on at the Ricketts. <laughs> Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Okay. Uh, for both children and adults. Um, for, the, for the kids, we have uh, one uh, Easter egg hunt on March 28th. Uh, it's from 4 until 5 p.m. Uh, we have karate training for the kids weekdays, 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, Hip hop dancing weekdays from 5.30 to 7. Uh, there's ballet classes, uh, Mondays and Fridays. Um, it, it, is that sponsored by the borough? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yes, that. it is. Yep. It is sponsored by the borough. Um, for adults, on April 18th, there's a health fair. Um, they're offering free health screenings from 10 a.m. to noon. Uh, for more information, call 610-367-367. 2313 extension one. Um, April 19th, there's a blood drive sponsored by the NAACP uh, on 12 noon until 5 p.m. Uh, the NAACP is also having their monthly meeting on March 28th, starts at seven. Uh, we want to thank the AARP members and our community members that are helping with our Pottstown kids in their activities. Um, any questions, feel free to call the borough um, for any further questions. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, Pottstown School District, Councilor Lindsay. Okay, so I'm not sure if you guys know this, but Beauty and the Beast is going on at the high school. I haven't went, I'm, go I'm, I'm trying to go this weekend, but my grandbaby is having a father-daughter dance in Easton, so I'm going to try to do both, but we'll, that's a whole nother story. Anyways, I wanted to tell you about the Beauty and the Beast, and um, at the high school, online tickets, prices, $5 per student, $10 per adult. At the door, $7 per student, $12 um, for adults. Then um, the shows is Friday, uh, March 8th at 7 p.m., Saturday, March 9th at 1 p.m. This is the sensory friendly, so the lights and everything. And Saturday, March 9th at 7 p.m. and Sunday, March 10th at 2 p.m. You can go um, online on um, the high school or the school district, and there's a um, little... UR code thing, you can scan it and you can buy tickets there or you can buy it at the door. That's it for me. Thanks. And from our solicitor, Mr. Garner, what can you teach us tonight? Um, good evening, Dan, and good evening, everyone. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, every month we try to pick a topic that has some relevance to council, hopefully help you out. Um, the topic this month is the process for uh, ordinance enforcement. And uh, the process is somewhat different than enforcing other ordinances that we have on our books. Um, the municipality's planning code um, was amended back in the early 1990s so that uh, zone ordinances are enforced through a civil enforcement notice as opposed to a uh, non-traffic citation, which is the normal process for our other ordinances. So what, what that means to the layperson is that the evidentiary standard of proof is different. Um, we're not talking about fines, we're talking about money damages. And the entire process is, is laid out in the planning code. Um, in the borough, we start out the 
zoning enforcement process with kind of a notification letter if it appears that there's a zoning violation. And for purposes of illustration, we'll just do something simple like perhaps a shed that's in the front yard, which is not permitted, and it doesn't have a permit. So the initial uh, action would be simply a letter to the property owner uh, indicating that there may be a zoning violation, uh, indicate what that is, and request further information or contact the zoning office. Um, that's done as a courtesy for all of the enforcement actions. Uh, depending upon whether or not there's a response, there could be follow-up emails or another letter to try to get some information or compliance if it's believed that there's a violation of the ordinance. Uh, none of that preliminary notification is required in the state law, but what the state law does require is a formal letter called a zoning violation notice letter. And that's the first official trigger that there is a zoning violation. And in the state law, it's, there's requirements of what has to be in that letter. And uh, the letter identifies the violation. In our illustration, it would be there's a shed. Uh, we don't have a permit for it. You're required to have a permit. And it's in the front yard. And, it, and the ordinance doesn't allow for the shed in the front yard. Um, it would cite the sections of the ordinance. Uh, it would include a copy of the relevant parts of the zoning ordinance. And then it would indicate that there's some action that has to be taken by the owner or the tenant of the property. And that could be something like remove the shed, file a permit application. Um, and there's usually 10 or 15 days to take that action. But more importantly, the notice would say, if you disagree that you're in violation, or if you want the shed to remain, you have an option to file an appeal to the borough zoning hearing board. And you must do that within 30 days. Um, the letter goes on to say that if you fail to take any action and if you fail to file the appeal, uh, there is the possibility the borough could institute a civil action against you. And if you are found responsible, you could pay up to $12,000 in damages and the way the, the way the law reads is it's $500 a day per violation. And the letter also would say, and this is all permitted by state law, that you can be assessed attorney's fees, reasonable attorney's fees incurred by the municipality to bring the enforcement action. So the letter is relatively standard. It's about two pages and it gives 30 days for action to be taken in some form. Uh, when action is not taken or nothing is done or there is no response, at some point, a uh, municipality is permitted to file a civil complaint with the district justice and seek damages for the violation. Um, the district justice's job in that case is to determine what the damages are the district justice is not permitted to say there is no violation. If there's a question as to the violation, that would be heard by the zoning hearing board, not the district justice. So in a brief nutshell is the process of enforcing our zoning ordinance. Uh, we try to provide as much notice as possible prior to taking any formal action. But uh, at times when there is no response to any of the correspondence, the zoning violation notice, uh, in a worst case scenario, civil action is filed with the MDJ and it proceeds into court if it can't be resolved. Um, the typical time frame for that whole process can be anywhere from five months to a year. So it's, it's not like it's a, a quick process, nor is there any time quick action taken. Uh, the borough's goal is always compliance with the ordinance. Uh, it's not looking for money, but at some point, if there is no response, um, the only option is to file suit. And I think I covered everything I wanted to. I'm happy to answer any questions any of you might have. Uh, hopefully, the uh, 
information is helpful to you since what we're doing is really consistent with the state law and the planning code elements for a civil enforcement action. Good. Any questions? Well, I'd recommend getting your zoning permits because uh, you know, you fence reconstruction is a zoning permit as well. And then this was probably maybe 12, 15 years ago. Uh, I did not get a permit to rebuild my fence. And it, it, had I done so, um, the zoning offer would have told me that you're building your neighbor's fence, not yours. So I did <laughs> $5,000 fence for my neighbor. <laughs> Anything else? Well, there's, cer this, there's certainly reasons why you need a permit, but again, sheds, fences, certain things have zoning permits. And again, it, it's, it's not a complicated process if you just follow the rules and typically the notifications exactly what should be done in order to bring it into compliance. Okay. Um, I have a question. How are uh, violations reported? I mean, is someone driving around or just happen, you know, how, how's that process done? And uh, is the borough consistent with enforcing that, pol that policy? Well, my, my answer on consistency, Joe, would be yes. Um, we're uh, looking for zoning violations across the board. So everyone is, is being treated in the same fashion, but there, there's no real zoning police, if you will. Um, again, it, it can be complaint driven or sometimes it's, it's just notice you know, by, by people seeing something that doesn't look right. So it's not like someone's going out to look for things, but if, if the borough receives a complaint or if uh, obviously a, a shed pops up on a property that wasn't there, uh, it's pretty obvious to, to anybody that sees it that there may be an issue. And, you know, our inspectors are around town, so they see things, but, but again, they're not necessarily out there just looking for zoning violations. Right. Thank you. Certainly. Anyone else? I can. Okay. Thank you, Chuck. Certainly. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Uh, and from the mayor, your report. Yes. Good evening. Um, let's see. Since last time, um, Councilwoman Banny and I, along with um, Zach and Dave Hay Haygood and uh, Public Works, went on um, the recycling tour for the Mascaro recycling uh, plant. Um, and I am grateful that we went because I am actually confident now that our recycling is actually being recycled and the money that we are spending on our trash contract, um, it, they're actually recycling these materials. They're going places. They're not going in the trash. Um, I know that Zach and Dave are uh, most likely creating like a pamphlet or education materials, but I just wanted to share a few things. Um, so the plant processes 500 to 800 tons of recyclable material a day. Hmm. And there's actual people sorting. Hmm. So there's a line, but there are human beings operating the plant. Um, potato chip bags are recyclable. Who knew? You don't have to wash them out. The turkey foil, the foil turkey pan that you make your holiday bird in, that's recyclable. You don't have to wash it. You don't. You don't gotta wash it. No, you don't have to scrape it out and clean it and soak it. Make you sure just it's empty. empty it out. I just do. I was I was impressed. So um, and then one thing that we learned not to do, which unfortunately I've been doing this. So um, no stacking your materials. And what that means is do not put everything in a bag and then stick it in your recycling. Because like a Walmart the bag. You can't stick everything. No. Don't do it. Because the recycling um, truck mm -hmm. is a compactor. Mm -hmm. So when you put mixed materials in your Walmart bag, right. it crushes them all together and they can't separate it. Ooh. So that just goes in the trash. Ooh. So loose, 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 shake them all out. Um, they don't open bags. So um, don't put everything in bags. And just use common sense. Don't throw diapers in the recycling bins. Be respectful. And one thing that you should never put in, which was there when we went, um, people put hoses in the recycling bin. Those are not recyclable, and they get caught in the machine and shut it down. 
So the whole plant shuts down and they have to go and take it out. So don't put your uh, hoses in there. And what else? Uh, coldest night of the year. Um, Tom, I see that here. I don't know if you're going to make a public comment. I don't want to. You are? OK, so I'm not going to steal your thunder and like share no, we statistics. <laughs> but I will say, not only did we crush the goal twofold, but we got outside and we enjoyed a really nice 5K stroll and made like new friends. And it was really warmed my heart to see Pottstown come out in the masses, especially just given all of the division in our community over this national issue. So thank you, Pottstown. And I also want to thank my teammates, Jen Green, Annette Cobb, Lisa Ternita Rich, Greg Way, Beth Garrison, Tammy and Phil Vautner, and Holly Phillips from Dana. Um, and I want to say a special thank you to our donors. Um, I'm terrible at fundraising, so thank you for helping us <laughs> meet our goal. Uh, Mr. or Mrs. Price, Marlene Armato, Dr. Vernon Ross, Karen Sanchez, Smoothie Q. If you haven't been to Smoothie Q, by the way, you have to go. Her food is amazing. Um, Karen Hudson, Beth Desch, Brooke Newborn, Brandon Yields, Chris Fallon, Jim Durr, Katrina, Bowder and Cochiba. And I also want to thank our root sponsor, Obermeyer. Um, oh, I got to deliver Meals on Wheels this week for family service with the consumers of Kencrest. Um, Meals on Wheels, they're always looking for volunteers. It's really rewarding. Um, if you haven't done it, I suggest like just go out one time, see how you like it. Um, in some cases, you're the only face or person that these residents interact with all day long. And so, you know, a few pleasantries can make a huge difference in their life. Um, community Health and Dental is gaining a new pediatrician, which is good. Um, I want to thank Tower Health for hosting our CLB meeting today. And I also want to thank Seth Clark of SRC Excavation and Construction. For the past two days, Seth has been demoing 419 Hale Street for us. Um, that is one of the houses in the explosion site that burned down. Um, and so within a week or two, that site should be cleared and safe and filled in, and the kids don't have to walk past that burned down property anymore. Um, Seth came in under all of the quotes because he knew we, we had a grant. That's all we had. Um, and the homeowner requested that I watch the demolition to ensure any items of tangible personal property didn't go get thrown out. And I'm thinking it, bur it, like, it burned down. So I wasn't really expecting to find much. Um, but Seth found for me today, and I can't wait to tell the family. They're probably, um, I'll tell them later tonight. Uh, their family photos survived the fire. They were in a record player and baby books. And so I have them drying out in my living room, like with fans and stuff. Um, so I can't believe that those actually survived uh, that. So it's pretty, pretty amazing. Yep. All right, coming up, um, check the borough website. Your Parks and Rec newsletter just came out. Pottstown Boys Basketball. They are playing the 2024 PIAA 5A championship round one. Their record is 18 and seven. Mm -hmm. They are playing Imhotep Charter on Friday at 7 p.m. in West Philly High School. I'm not going to that game. But if they win, their next game is March 12th. Um, and I will go to that one. So I wish them well on their way to their championship. Um, as Ternita mentioned, Go see Beauty and the Beast. Also on Friday, Steel Magnolia opens um, at Steel River. And um, you should purchase your subscription now um, to get your pack in for the year because the prices go up soon. Um, Friday, March 15th at 6, um, the Tri-County Active Adult um, Center at 7 p.m is having a comedy show fundraiser for St. Patrick's Day with um, dinner um, for tickets. Call 610-323-5009. Saturday, March 16th, 6 to 9, Rivet is having a Cirque de Vaudeville Gatsby two-hour theater showcase. 
fundraiser. Um, proceeds go to Anne Francis Outreach Foundation, Helping Hands, and the YWCA. March 22nd, Pottstown High School is putting on um, a Pottstown's Got Talent show, but I don't know what time that is, so do you know? Talent show? What, what time? Do you know? Sorry. Okay. 6.30. Thank you. Thank you. Um, also, the 23rd at 7 p.m., um, PAID is having their fundraiser, so get your tickets now because on the 23rd um, at, um, sorry, Santander Arena, the Reading <coughs> Royals are playing for St. Patrick's Day, um, and happy hour starts at 6 p.m. There's pregame photos, um, a chance to win $10,000, a nice raffle, 50-50. Um, so um, get your tickets, um, proceeds go to paid, and if you have questions, you can go to info at paidinc.org. March 26th, <laughs> Rivet is also having a fundraising celebrity bar attending event fundraiser for Pottstown Education. March 30th, we are doing a spring cleanup along Keystone Boulevard, and March 31st is Easter. April 7th, um, oh, Unleashed Counseling, um, which is at 1800 East High Street, Suite 100. They have um, some free monthly events, and I just wanted to share because a friend of mine just lost their pet, and I know, um, you know, pets are, a lot of people treat pets like our family, and so um, it's hard to lose one. So they have a free pet loss support group the first Sunday of every month. Um, the first one starts Sunday, April 7th at 11 a.m., and you can just uh, show up, and they have a uh, licensed therapist uh, leading the group. Save the date. April 13th is Edgewood cleanup from 10 to 2. And I have um, an announcement. Pottstown NAACP is doing their Road to Reading program for children 0 to 8 um, to encourage literacy and improve reading um, scores in the community. Um, they're looking for volunteers to help pass books out, put labels on, monitor, um, choose books for kids. Um, if you're interested, you can contact Sandy or Bob Bowers at 610-327-1213. And I'm going to end my report on really sad news, so I'm sorry. Hmm. But Bruce Madera passed away. And, you know, the last time I saw him, I awarded him kindness port points um, for his ward. Um, you know, Bruce was really passionate about this community and he kept us all on our toes. And I know he was a bit of a pain, but he, he really did keep us all on our toes. And I don't know if there's anyone else that I've met in Pottstown that is so <laughs> passionate about their community. Um, so I really will miss him and maybe we can do something to honor his name, like, I don't know, change public comments to the Madeira Minute or something. <laughs> I don't know. Something, but I don't think we should do something for him. I don't know what you think. So that ends my report. Thank you. Can I ask you one question? Yes. Thank you. I'm going to put you on the spot. Okay. I don't can know. Can we take that list of stuff you go over and print it out? Nobody's writing this down, and you seem to compile everything. So could so we print it out, maybe? Okay, so you, all right. Do you want? Did somebody clean it up and? I will work on that. Yes, you want it in the packet. Okay. Wouldn't that be helpful? Yes. yes. Okay. You wouldn't have to read. It'll be helpful for me. I walk out and I forget, so. Me too. Thanks for helping me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's what I do. Uh -oh. Okay, Over I have a question. Is be doing a lot of oh. and from our manager? I have a question. Yes. Oh, sorry. Go. I have a, yeah, I have a question. Um, this goes to Justin. Um, it kind of relates to what the mayor has said about re recycling and things like that. Um, years ago, 10, 12 years ago, we used to get paid for recycling material. Um, do we still get anything for that? Or if not, what happened to that program? Did it just phase out, phase out over time? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the program has really ramped down over the years. We used to get a lot more out of that program than we do now. Um, but we still have um, trash and, and, and recycling 
grants that we are uh, receiving, and those can be um, anywhere in the in the area total for the both of them, somewhere between you know fifty and seventy thousand dollars a year, something like that. But uh, we don't get the return on the recycling like we used to because, quite frankly, there's not a lot of money in recycling, and that's what uh, Mascara was trying to do with their RFlex program is to try to figure out how they can use different types of uh, recycling materials to incorporate them into more products so that they become you know, more, more valuable for these companies to use. Great. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Keller, your report. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, everyone. So a uh, couple important updates for you. Um, we did begin negotiations with the um, PPOA, the Police Officers uh, Union. So um, we'll be looking forward to uh, upcoming sessions with, with them, and certainly we'll keep uh, council updated on, on key uh, um, updates and um, feedback that we get from them. Also, uh, we do have a winter and spring newsletter out through the Parks and Recreation Department. Uh, there's a lot of helpful information in there about some of the programs that we have in town, as well as uh, the events, and just some general um, kind of borough knowledge about different projects and things that are, that are going on. Um, I do have a no number of other uh, parks-related projects. Uh, the department has been very busy ramping up for spring. Um, we've got some major grant-funded uh, projects coming this month. The main one is Streambank uh, Restoration along Manitoni Creek Bridge. That is um, slated to begin today, right? And um, so that actually necessitates a closure of the Schuylkill River uh, trail through the park for about um, one month. And I don't know, Michael, do you have a um, total project time on that that you'd be willing to offer tonight? Duration for that? Yeah, sure. Uh, sure thing. You spoke correctly. We're going to beginning begin with uh, the waterway restoration portion of things. That should take three weeks, um, say four weeks at the outside, and then they'll actually disengage from the work. We'll reopen for a number of months while a uh, second component is fabricated, uh, and then we'll go to the bridge uh, portion of it. There's no way of saying for sure when that will be. The anticipation would be, though, that that's uh, August, September, October in that vicinity, and that would necessitate another month-long closure. So altogether, uh, two months closed approximately, but they're not consecutive. Good. Thank you very much. Appreciate that update. Um, also, uh, just want to congratulate the Parks and Rec Department again um, for being recognized at the PA Park Society Annual Conference this year with another. This is a second excellence in uh, recreation award in as many years. Um, this one for 2024 will be given to them in recognition of excellence and programming for the Manitoni Green Spooky Golf Program, which I know that... Uh, we really went all out in this year, and uh, we're really honored to receive that award. I've been trying to get that spooky golf for several years. Me too. The line is always ginormous, and I end up leaving. <laughs> you come with me. I can Maybe you can get me in. I don't know. Yeah. Sorry. So thank you. Um, Mike Lenhart and Andy Graham for your work on that, as well as the other members of the Park and Recreation Department. Um, also, not on the agenda tonight, but it'll appear on Monday. Uh, we didn't have time to put it on for tonight, but we'll be seeking permission to apply to DCNR for a CTP2 grant. Uh, that will be for renovations to Brookside Park. It'll replace playground equipment and provide ADA accessibility uh, improvements. So we'll have a resolution ready for you on Monday night for that one. And um, that concludes my report. Very good. Was, Thank you. Wow. Oh, tell us. Um, <laughs> bus diesel fuel bill, that's in? Yep, that's in. We'll have a recommendation for everyone on that on Monday night. All right, we'll list that for Monday uh, 12. Is all the lawn and right-of-way maintenance bids, they're good? Yep, same thing there. We'll, we're reviewing those and have a recommendation on Monday. Good. Mm -hmm. uh, zoning application for 276, 278 North Hanover. Chuck? Yeah, Dan, actually, on this, we have a presentation by the applicant. Okay. Thank you.
thank you uh, all for having us again uh, this evening. Um, I shared two presentations. One is going to be on this particular parcel. The other one are our case studies of projects we've completed. They're being handed out as well to council members and to folks so that way, in case we don't have enough time, you can always feel free to review uh, what we've done in the, in the local MSA in Philadelphia and Delaware County over the past couple of years. Uh, I'll wait for the presentation to get up. In particular, what Dwight City Group does is we are focused on adaptive reuse. We revitalize old buildings which don't service the current utility of the local municipality and the environment. Uh, is it encrypted? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so uh, what we do is we go into old warehouses, old office buildings, and we convert them into modern usage for what I would consider market rate luxury apartments that still have a reasonable price point. So we try to make sure that there is an AMI, an average median income, affordable component in there. So they look great, yet at the same time, they have a price that's affordable for market rate tenants without being priced out of their own neighborhood, which is important to us. Um, in this particular parcel, I'll just go off my memory, we are basically trying to convert the current uh, warehouse into 84, uh, 85 apartments. And the challenge that we're having is that there's right now a large parking lot area which will be repaved and brought back to life. Uh, my understanding from my past prior visits is that that particular parking lot has uh, eroded over many years. So we would be able to basically reset that parking lot into proper working order. And additionally, we would accommodate within the building an additional 28 spaces. So what that allows us to do is it gets us to about 1.7 parking spaces per apartment. However, the current code requires two parking spaces per apartment. So what we did is we went back to the drawing board and we looked at our current portfolio of 2,300 plus apartments in the MSA and we said, well, let's take a poll. How many parking spaces is our current apartments using on average? And we took a list of units and buildings that, we, that were spread out between the suburban and urban environments. And we came out to a rough estimate based off of speaking with tenants, going through how many parking uh, passes are issued to folks for that parking lot. And we discovered that there's a significant difference between the usage on a, a parking spaces for a three bedroom apartment versus a one and a two. And we found that the average uh, one and two bedroom apartment uses less than one and a half, about 1.2 uh, parking spaces per apartment versus the three bedroom uses about one and a half. Simultaneously, this site, we do not intend on building any three bedroom apartments. They're all gonna be one and two bedroom apartments. So we believe that utilizing current market data that we have access to, coupled with the fact that there is a national standard of 1.2 1 .2 from- 1.23 by the uh, National Transportation Engineer. And that's why Jake has a job. 1.23 <laughs> by the National <laughs> Transportation Engineering Department. So because of that, we believe that advocating for a lower parking to unit ratio would be not just uh, advantageous to us for this particular project, but actually would be in line with the actual usage going on in our portfolio in the national standards, uh, as opposed to the demand for two parking spaces in each. Um, now I'm really glad I printed out those handouts tonight. Uh, if you have an opportunity to look through the handouts, these are not sites that we wish to do. These are sites that are completed. And what we did is we did before and after photos. You can really see what happens when we go into an old uh, vacant building and what we can create from it. Uh, I heard a lot tonight also about reading and the community. And just something I want to share with you. We did a project in Darby, PA. And there's a Catholic school around the corner uh, that wanted to run a program. And uh, we spoke to some of our investors and we spoke to local sponsors and we teamed up with the Reading Coalition and we did a read to run program for those students where uh, it's a much smaller school obviously than a public school, but we did a program for them for read to run sponsored by us, Reading Coalition Across America, and we basically sponsored 10 issues for students that took on a reading challenge. And then we found a sponsor to get us the tennis shoes. So we're not just a group that comes in to do a project. We really believe that if we come into a community, we have to be a part of that community. And that's the best way to ensure that the longevity of our investment is secure because we're building up not just a building, but we're building up everything around ourselves. And the more that we invest with those around us, the stronger we become as a company. So I thank you for your time. If you have any questions, I am available. Uh, and if we, he's still working on we, um, it. It's all good. Yeah, we didn't have a, 
uh, PDF uh, loads. So we had to make a PDF. We can, I don't know, we're close to bringing that up, but. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, we have the case studies PDF if that. Yeah, we can go through that in the meantime. That's fine. Yeah. I did have um, a question, yes. so to say. Um, but I know there's two areas that you mentioned. I grew up in, in Delco. Oh, OK, um, great. They are difficult areas. Um, so I'm glad to hear that's where you went into um, and that you care about the community. <laughs> I appreciate that. I visited the, uh, your community. project in Darby, and then it's uh, actually, even with JPS, I had trouble finding it initially. And then I saw this big building, well lit, and I was like, oh, I hope that's it. And of course it was. And yeah, it was, uh, very impressed with what you guys did with that one. For Thank you. Yes. Thank you. We're, we're big believers in creating a really strong, and I think I spoke about this last time, a really strong security and lighting plan for our buildings. It has to be well lit. There has to be lots of video cameras. Folks coming into a new building that was a vacant warehouse for many years or an unutilized office building for many years, there's a natural hesitation. The, the more lit up it is, the more it feels welcoming, the more somebody goes into this environment and feels safe, the better they're going to be as a tenant for us because the longer they're going to stay. So this is our DCG case studies. And there we go. We can go through that confidential now. Just don't worry about that. <laughs> Okay, so this is a great example. This is actually in a neighborhood you might have heard of called Kensington, Allegheny. Uh, it's right on the border, and uh, it falls in the Juniata borderline, and it's actually right next to the fire department. So uh, this building, they were having multiple issues with this property for many, many years, and when we bought it, uh, we kept having a, a continuous challenge with the local neighborhood. Uh, when you start creating a construction project in a neighborhood that is ran the way Kensington Allegheny, unfortunately, has gone into. Uh, folks like to go in there for shelter, for warmth, and for free materials. And this was an ongoing challenge. So we had to have full-time security there the entire time. But as we go through the pictures, I don't have a mouse, sorry. As we go through uh -huh. the pictures, you'll see this is what it looked like when we bought it. And during the construction process, we had trees growing inside the building as well. Mm. And then we'll continue at the final stage. Just keep going. You'll see these are the apartments we finished in that building. So it's amazing to see how you can take an old abandoned warehouse that the police and fire department were having challenges with and suddenly turn it into a valuable asset that has brought actually mostly commuters, because it's not far from 95, to this community. And so now what that's done is that there's a shopping center on 1500 East Erie that used to have a lot of challenges with not enough uh, patrons that today is doing much better because we brought in 58 apartments with income producing market rate tenants into the neighborhood that are now buying food and shopping at the shopping center across the corner. So it's a great example how you know changing over one building has an impact across the street at another asset. Go to the next one, please. I and this. I cannot believe, sorry, I cannot believe that you did that to the Castor building. I'm so impressed. Yes. I've driven by that building so many times for decades and wow. Thank you. Thank you. It was a, I'd love to say it was a labor of love, but it was a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things we do here, of course, in all of our neighborhoods, we make sure that we have gated parking. If you want to go back even one shot, uh, that's mm. like a 10-foot gate. There's a special security system to get in. We have 35 security cameras. There's a code to get into the parking lot. There's a code to get into the building. There's a code to get into your second floor. We also, in some of the building, rougher neighbors actually have an employee who lives in the building. So one of our supers will be living in the building as well, and they keep an extra eye on the place. So we're a big believer in keep the home safe, keep it secure, and more people will want to come. OK, let's go to the next. Uh, this is the one on Quarry and Darby. Uh, the Darby had not had a new construction project for residential apartments in almost, I think, it was 50 years at the time when we bought it. And if you'll go through it, this is a 125,000 square foot warehouse sitting on three and a half acres. It was used in the 1920s as a, uh, as a suspender company. And these are some great pictures we got from the icons. We're actually um, archives. We're actually blowing those up and putting them uh, in frames. And they're going to be on some of our hallways so that people who are walking through can understand what this building used to be used before it was revitalized. If you go to the next. This gives you a layout of the location. It was completely boarded up for many years. Uh, there was no roof, by the way, either on this building wow. when we bought it. And that you begin to see the construction. The framing mm -hmm. is taking forth. The core drilling is taking place. Keep going. And then we have to pipe in brand new utility systems. And then finally, go. Mm -hmm. This is now an evolution of the exterior. And now finally, this is our lobby. 
Mm. So this is a brand new lobby, brand new elevator systems. It really changes the dynamic of what the building looks like today. Uh, we had a ribbon cutting, the mayor and council people were there, and they had not been in there since we broke ground, and for them, it was just astonishing to see the transformation. You just keep going, fourth hallway. These are the apartments. We created really nice luxury loft apartments. I will say the apartments that we try to build are always going to be larger in size. Uh, we're a big believer you need to give folks a little more space, but also when you're trying to get them into a building that hasn't been utilized in many years, they need that extra elbow room. They're, they're going to want the selling point of, hey, I'm getting 900 square feet, 1,000 square feet for the same price that 600 square feet was around the street. And this gives you an example of the final. I don't want to bore everybody here, but you know this keeps going on and on. We have several more projects on here. This is one in Hunting Park. We have another one in Hunting Park we're about to start. Hunting. And this is the finished product that as well from an adaptive reuse warehouse. So I think the message that the White City Group really wants to send tonight is that we'd love the opportunity to do something special. Oh, this is a great case study. This was an abandoned uh, condo that had not been occupied since the 90s. These are some great pictures. Yeah, that's what wow. it looked like when I bought it. It was great. And this is what it looks like now. Wow. <laughs> that's nice. Yeah. That was a really, really interesting job mm -hmm. to work on. It's also right behind a school. So we had to go to the school first, knock on the doors, explain to them what we wanted to do, work well with them, explain to them how you know we're here to make the neighborhood better. And we understand you have a lot of students, and we have a construction project. So we're going to watch out for them. You watch out for us. And it's a partnership to make this thing happen. And the school really worked with us, so we were able to make it done. Uh, and of course, Market Street. And that's also a vacant office building that we worked on for many years that we were able to revitalize. So we'd like the opportunity to do something similar in Pottstown. Uh, we'd love for you to walk with us on the uh, parking component, because that seems to be the greatest challenge we have to be able to put in 84 apartments. Uh, there's simply not enough space to do a two-to-one ratio, but we can get more than one and a quarter to, to make uh, national standards, which is our goal. Are we good? No? All right, next time. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Are there any questions? Yeah. Yes. Um, some of those pictures look familiar. Did you do a presentation in front of us yeah. about eight, eight years ago? Yes, yeah, so uh, a few months back, we, we attempted to <clears throat> obtain this property. Uh, we made a presentation. We thought that we would have a little more time. We didn't. We ran out of time. Uh, the owner was kind enough to re-engage with us and gave us an opportunity to come back in front of you with enough time to hopefully uh, receive a variance to, for the parking. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm talking about longer than that, probably eight years ago, so six, eight years ago, no? Uh, I would, no. Uh, Dwight City, so just to give yeah. you some background, Dwight City Group is, is only about six years old. Uh, okay. We are launched from Dwight Capital, which is one of the largest HUD lenders in the country. And I joined them about six years ago to launch Dwight City Group to focus on specifically multifamily and adaptive reuse, which is my own personal passion. Okay, great. Um, what is the plan as far as um, uh, management and maintenance like for the buildings you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now? Uh, so 20 years from now, I'm not sure, uh, but I can speak for the next five. How about that? Uh, five years after completion, uh, we are in, first of all, we're, we, we don't really sell assets. We're a long-term holder. Uh, the majority of the folks who invest in these deals are not hedge funds or pension funds. They're family offices. They're folks who want longevity in their investment. They want that their money that's placed and invested into a city or in a community or into a town is something that is long-term and secure. Uh, so they're not, you know, quick flippers. Uh, as you might find in some parts of the industry. Uh, in terms of management, uh, we have uh, basically a management partner that handles everything from leasing to maintenance and repairs. Uh, we sometimes will use third-party contractors for snow removal, but uh, for the most part, there will be somebody living on site who handles all the day-to-day -day maintenance, and when it gets too big for them, they call HQ, which is in Philadelphia, and they will have somebody uh, to, help, uh, to help assist them. Okay, and that's for what you said five years. Yeah, that that that's the that's our yeah. That would be like a five to ten year plan. What happens after that? I mean, management and maintenance really won't change when it comes to multifamilies like this. So I I apologize yeah, about I the. Mean, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Joe. 
Yeah, I've, I've seen a lot of projects like this, um, you know, where the contractor or the builder, you know, has an agreement with the agreement where they maintain and build, you know, not maintain, but they uh, manage and, and, um, and um, you know, keep the building up for like five to 10 years or so. Then they hand over that responsibility to the board or something that's created by the tenants or, or something like that. Um, and then shortly after that, what happens is 10 years after that, the place is, doesn't look near what it did when, you, when, you, when it was first built. It goes down very quickly. I've seen that many, many times. Um, so, so allow me I, to, to, to differentiate. Um, that You might be referring to a condo developer who then creates a board that the tenants or owners create an association, a condominium association. This is different. This is an apartment okay. building that has one owner, which is Dwight City Group. We develop it ourselves. Right. We manage it ourselves. We own it ourselves. And the people living there are renters, so they're going to become, they basically sign year to year leases. Um, so it's our obligation to make sure that that building uh, not just has adequate life safety, but also has probably what we call a rental license, which is required in most municipalities. In order to get that rental license, you're going to have a fire safety inspection. They're going to wait and make sure smoke detectors are working. They're going to make sure your fire sprinkler cert is analyzed every single year. Your elevators need to be annually certified. So it's a very different environment than something that's turned over from a developer for a condo HOA, which is maybe what right, my, is more at risk. Right, but my concern is you, you're doing that for the first five to 10 years, correct? I, I mean, we're, we're building the building to own it. If it's doing well, we'll hold it after 10 years. Well, there's, there are HUD loans out there that are 35-year AM schedules that people buy and own buildings for 35 years. It's like having a single-family home. If you're living in it and it's giving utility to you and your family, you're not going to get rid of it. If we've invested in a deal and it's giving financial utility to us and our investors, we have no reason to sell it. Mm, okay. I just, All right. Thank you. If I may, can I make one clarification point? Um, as we said, this is private market rentals. You want to come to the mic? Oh, yes. Thank you. So can hear you. Just want to clarify, these are private market rentals, so there is a you know capital incentive. We have every reason to keep these as well maintained as possible because the rents go down if they're not. Thank you. Make. Yeah, that, that's a great point. It's an absolute <laughs> great point. Yeah. So, yeah. Judah, okay. I, I, mean, I apologize, but we do have that presentation loaded. If okay. there's anything you want to go back to, um, I'll do to, it quickly. Up, Why not? Sure. We'll be fast. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm, I wasn't actually finished, but oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Joe. I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, um, yeah. I've, I'm just. I'm, I just want to re reiterate that I've, you know, I've, I've seen this. I've seen this many a times, and um, I, uh, like I said, I want to re re uh, you know reiterate. I've seen situations where you know, the company comes in, maintains a building for 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 five to ten, fifteen years, and then. Either they sell the building or whatever, and a new board or whatever takes over. Maybe sometimes it's owned by by the tenants or whatever, and then it becomes a blight. Year, years later, you know, 10, 15 years later, it becomes a blighted situation. I've seen it dozens of times. Um, I'm just concerned. That's all I'm saying. I'm just concerned at this at this at this point. Okay. I'm just putting it out there. Okay, so this is the presentation on the, the parking that we were describing. Um, I'll just go to the screen because it's a little closer. I feel like a singer. <laughs> um, so one, one point in particular, this is your uh, ground floor layout um, looking from a bird's eye view. Uh, our goal is to create not just buffers, but if you go back, these are actually also these trees and all of these elements are actually there also to help with water runoff. So there's going to be a lot uh, that goes into designing the parking lot to make sure that it avoids water runoff, that you have proper catching basins underneath the parking lot. There's also special trees in the way that you plant all of, their, uh, all of the greenery around, not just to make it beautiful, but also to make sure that it absorbs as much water as possible. So there's a lot that goes into planning this. It's not just, oh, we'll put lots of trees around to make people happy and to make it beautiful. There's a methodology behind it in terms of you know, how it's going to impact the water and the drainage systems that are on the parking lot. 
But with that in mind, uh, you see the means of egress in and out. Uh, we would have additional 28 cars parked on the ground floor of this taller building. That gives us a total between these parking lots, between the parking lot, uh, the parking in the garage, as well as the uh, 17 spots of street parking right in front, it gives us a total of 146 parking spaces for 85 apartments. This is well above uh, what we currently utilize at all of our other buildings and above the national standards. So if we go to the next build, next slide please. This is a little bit of a parking analysis. We hired somebody to do for us a traffic study as well as a parking study. This is from their summary page that will get submitted at a later date, for their foot final report. But they reviewed it and they found that basically uh, the proposed uh, residential projects needs to provide 125 parking spaces to meet national standards. We're providing above national standards, we're providing 146 parking spaces. So that's another example from a specialist in parking that is putting together a report for everyone showing that we've actually gone above and beyond national standards. Still below the requirement of Pottstown, but that might be because things have changed over the past many years since some of these requirements were drafted. Going to the next page, this is a little bit of their summary talking about uh, the number of parking spaces and how it would impact on the traffic study. They also did a traffic count as well at that location and they found that based off of the current traffic count, taking into consideration uh, our building, uh, it would not impact traffic uh, beyond what's considered reasonable. So it still will stay within normal standards uh, off of their traffic study and we'll supply the traffic study at the final uh, presentation. But these are just some summaries that we wanted to share with you today. Going to the next one. This is actually the car trends taken from 252 different tenants across our portfolio, just to give you a bit of a sampling. It shows how many car spaces are actually utilized for studio apartments, one bedroom apartments, uh, two bedroom apartments, and three bedroom apartments. It also gave you the sampling of that, what was provided. We only provided based off of tenants that responded to the survey and tenants that worked with us. We obviously didn't make, want to make assumptions, but this is from actual survey tenants across our portfolio. So you can see how many cars are really being utilized by tenants that need them across some of our buildings. Going to the next one. This gives you a little bit of the idea of the layout of some of the units and in particular the ground floor and how the parking flow would go. So you would you have ample space for 28, park parking, uh, 28 parking spaces as well as not interfering with the residential units on the ground floor. Next. And this is, again, just a, for your viewing pleasure, a sample of the type of units we want to build out. Again, we will not have any units below 800 square feet. Uh, we also will have predominantly only ones and twos. We don't like to build studios. They have a turnover ratio that's way too fast for us. And we don't like to build three bedrooms either. It's just harder to maintain. Go on. And this is the final floor plan. So I I'm glad I got the opportunity to share this with all of you. Um, happy to answer any more questions. But we really wanted to show you that we thought through the parking process because we know it matters so much. And we also understand that that's really a barrier for us to be able to accomplish this project. So thank you. Can I ask you one question yes. um, about the parking? Sure. Are your buildings always or most of the time completely full? Uh, our, yeah, we're 95% plus occupied on average. OK. I was just wondering if any um, vacancy in the apartments make up for the parking or guests of tenants? So the newer buildings are actually 100% leased for the most part. Okay. The, our vacancy is predominantly on our older buildings because the units are a little older and have to be renovated. So we have two, we have two business models. One is adaptive reuse. We do about 200 units a year in that. And then the other product is we buy older buildings like that have, were built in the 50s and 60s and the kitchens are from the 1980s and we renovate those. Those buildings will sometimes actually hover on a lower occupancy. The adaptive reuse has much higher occupancy because folks want to pay the extra $200 a month to get a much nicer unit. Thank you. There's plenty of parking available when I went, well, I think it was like six o'clock in the evening at the Darby uh, project, so. Yeah, thank you. Okay, these are some examples of what's currently there and what's been there for 50 years, <laughs> which we want to change. Well, it was built in the 1920s, but. <laughs> I assume our, uh, our uh, tax collections would go up once this is improved. I mean, it's got to be, you know, once you finish it, it's got to be worth more than what the assessed value is now. Is that 
What you found that, in with other projects? Yeah, so what we typically do with these projects is if there's a type of LERDA, we will apply for the LERDA, but at the same time, even with the LERDA, we're always paying more in tax than whatever it was before when we bought it because we've increased the value so much. Mm -hmm. I mean, nine, nine out of 10 times, municipalities <coughs> will have some sort of program because the taxes can get really, really heavy in the first couple of years you really are trying to encourage people to go into this new building, and that's always a, a challenge to say, hey, we, we just redid this warehouse. Come with us this way, it's beautiful. And, and folks will go, but it takes some time. So there's typically a LERDA in most programs. I know Pottstown has one, but yes, the annual tax, even with the LERDA, will go up dramatically from what it's being paid right now. One more question, that's it. Um, I think the last time you were here, you talked about a space for uh, like work from home. Do you remember that? Yes. Yeah. Are these apartments also going to have that, or is that just one of the bedrooms in the two-bedroom apartment? So sometimes some of the apartments based on the layout will, but what we do is in the common area, we make sure that there's a small office space. So for example, in most of the buildings you see, uh, we'll take a small section of the building that it doesn't have a lot of utility, and we'll turn it into a small office environment, so that way it's like a business center for the folks who want to be able to work from home for one day, they can go down there. There's a Wi-Fi system that we pay for that's free for the tenants, and they can just sit at the desks, and they can work, and it's well lit, and it helps you know, create that work from home environment if they have a smaller unit. The larger unit sometimes will have that built into the unit. Thank you. Yeah. As somebody that works from home, I like that idea. Yeah, me too. Okay. Try, try to make one more comment really quickly to your question. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> So to your point, uh, Councillor Vanny, the idea here is walkable downtown. Judith didn't mention, but that is a centerpiece of our program, walkable downtowns. So we want to bring money. Um, we want to bring income, spend money in the businesses. The second piece to your question, uh, Mr. Keller, is the uh, earned income tax component. Right. So I forget off the top of my head, what are the requirements for income for the units um, annually? They're somewhere between $76,000 and $87,000 a year. We, yeah, so we, we, require, we require a certain income threshold uh, per family for renting to make sure that it's something that the people can afford to pay in terms of rent. Um, for these units, I believe the combined family income for two earners would be somewhere between seventy six dollars to $85,000 a year. So that's folks who have additional disposable income it's, you know, it to, to spend within the neighborhood uh, at the local uh, restaurants and uh, venues. And just for context, I think we did the math on that for the number of units, and it's somewhere around like eight to ten million uh, dollar pool of earned income tax that would then be tapped for EIT for the township as well. So I just want to mention that also. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Justin, can I ask a general question on parking for sure. residential parking permits? What is the requirement? What do you have to show to get a parking permit <clears throat> here? Um, well, this is in regard to this project, right? Well, I'm just, so, well, <clears throat> my, my point is if you have to register your vehicle with the borough, mm -hmm. there are many people driving out there that shouldn't be driving um, and don't have, like, driver's licenses or registered cars or, or whatnot. So... Like, if you have to get a permit and show from the borough and show that your car is insured and your driver's license is up to date and everything, mm -hmm. um, people may not be able to do that. And because they don't have those, uh, they're not insured. And so then one less car off the road. Like, they can't park in the borough. Yeah. Um all the information for our uh, parking permits is on our website, um, but I really wouldn't be prepared to answer that question tonight. Um, that's some, that's a question for the police department. They uh, usually handle that, or the finance department. So, okay. thanks. Sorry. Okay, uh, we're at 14, 2024 paving presentation. <laughs> yeah. That. Yep. Um, 
Good evening, and um, thank you for the opportunity to present our 2024 uh, paving plan. Uh, with me tonight is Doug Yerger, our Director of Public Works. And um, for some of you, I know that this is going to be a little bit of a rerun of some of the information that we kind of present every year, but I think that for some of the listeners in the audience, it is important to make sure that um, they, un they understand how we uh, go about our paving, uh, the different things that are involved with that, and also the counselors with you tonight, you have a map along with a um, street list showing all the uh, roads that uh, the borough paves. So um, in the borough, we've got uh, 60 miles of borough roadways. So these are, are our responsibility. We've got about 19 miles of, of, of alleys, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. But um, most of the alleys are not ordained or adopted, and so therefore they're um, not the borough's responsibility, but the responsibility of the adjoining property owner. However, the borough does go and um, upon request and, and fill potholes and um, from time to time level out alleys or add stone if we have extra, extra millings. Now we've got um, 10 miles of state roads, uh, approximately 10 miles. So these are High Hanover, Charlotte, Arm & Hammer, Manitoni State, Marine, uh, West King, Route 100, and then just uh, 422 just outside the borough as well. These would be responsible, uh, responsibility of the state. When we're looking at funding sources um, to cover curb to curb paving, there's really four uh, main mm -hmm. ways that we fund this. So the, the, the primary way that we do this is through state funds. So the state funds are uh, allocated through the gas tax that everybody pays, and then they're reallocated to the borough um, from the, uh, in the form of a liquid fuels fund. So uh, in the past couple years, we've been averaging about uh, $800,000 a year um, through the liquid fuels funds. The liquid fuels funds um, can be used for paving, but they can also be used for other roadway-related items, such as uh, bridge repairs, um, line striping, uh, traffic signs, I think, things like that. Um, but uh, in, here in the borough, we try to reserve all the liquid fuels funds strictly for paving because our general fund hasn't um, gotten to the point where we can support um, additional paving, paving through uh, the borough uh, funds. The other way that we get paving is through the, the uh, borough authority. So um, they've been very gracious that when they do water and sewer main replacement projects, they uh, replace that, that street, um, usually curb to curb on those projects as well. And then uh, we've got other utility companies. So PICO, um, they, uh, if they've got two lateral cuts within 50 feet, that's our borough ordinance, they are required to pave that, that, that lane or that roadway. Um, on that project. So um, I'll get into some of the PICO work. We've got a good amount of that coming up this year, uh, including one that's going, that already started this month and will conclude this month in front of Borough Hall. Roadway impact fees. Um, this is a new one for 2024. So if you recall, this is what um, the uh, Borough and the Authority passed last year, which basically collects funds from the bulk haulers that are uh, hauling sewage to the, the sewer plant. And we're generating about $180,000 annually on this. Um, the caveat to this funding is that it can only be used for certain roadway improved uh, roadways. Um, and those are the roadways where the, the trucks primarily travel on to get to the sewer plant. So these are Industrial, Moser, uh, Center Ave, Wilson Street, and, and um, North Kime Street. Additionally, um, we allocate a small amount, about $25,000, of funding for maintenance on um, uh, uh, borough roadways, such as filling potholes and things of that nature. And then I'm going to um, turn it over to our public works director to go over um, briefly some of the uh, criteria that, w that we use to evaluate which roads uh, get paved. Obviously, there's only a certain amount of money that we, ha we, that we have, and that money only goes so far um, to be able to pave the roads. So, um, it's based on a ranking system, and, we'll, and go ahead, Doug, you can okay. summarize that for us. Yeah, the ranking system goes from one to five, five being the worst. And most roads, like once they're paved, they're going to be a one for a number of years. Um, and then as they start to crack, then it goes to two, three, four, and five. What happens right now, I've got so many fives that I created a six because I had to keep them separated while I'm trying to sort all this out. So there is a six group now, but... Uh, Hopefully, we we're, we're seem to be getting a little bit ahead of it, and uh, 
There's, there's certainly a lot less sixes than there are fives right now. Um, but as you can see here, you know, like number two rating, I mean, the road's starting to develop some cracking and stuff, and three, it gets worse. Potholes might start opening up. Um, number four, it's getting, you know, that road's getting a little worse with the cracking. And then till you get to a five, it's been patched up, depending on how hard the winters are to us, the potholes open up, and then we have to keep patching them. And then they get really nasty after that because then the patches a lot of times will pop up when we have uh, freeze stall cycles and stuff like that. So um, that's, that's the way the rating system works right now. All the roads that I have one right now are either fives or sixes, and there's reasons why some of that happens as far as um, we have some stormwater work that's going to be involved. So some of those road, roads might have been fives, but we're putting the stormwaters in. So once we get the inlets and the pipes in and stuff like that, we're going to pave it afterwards. So it depends. There's other other factors sometimes that get into this as to um, you know why that number five got to to the top. Uh, it's just the same as like we have some roads we're going to do some sewer work on, but we're not doing a lot of sewer work. So once that basic work is done, maybe a small section, 100, 200 foot of that road, we're going to go ahead and pave the whole thing afterwards, just because it is you know, problematic. Um, so, uh, let's see and then I can take this okay. one. So, yeah, so, um, you know, of the, the worst rated roadways here that we've, we've got, we've got about 7.38 miles of, of those. And under our plan for this year, uh, we're going to pave 2.67 miles of, of those worst roadways. So, um, the other thing that we really try to do to the greatest extent is coordinate with planned utility work. Um, it, you know, it always seems that you, you pave a road and then um, in the, the next year somebody else digs it up, which is kind of exactly what's happening out in front of us with High Street, um, where Pico is going to be digging up to install their gas main. The good news there is that's all going to be on the south side. It's going to be in the shoulder. So it's not really going to impact the travel lanes at all or the rideability there, and then they will repave that when they're when they're done um, per the PennDOT requirements. But um, you know, we also uh, look into the sewer mains. We video them. We make sure the pipes are in good condition. Um, if we've got pipes that look suspect, this is what happened on Sunset Drive. So Sunset Drive was in really bad shape, and, and like Doug said, it probably made it to that six category because we knew we had to replace a pipe there. But we were still two years out from the authority's next main project. So for that particular one, we had to wait um, until the main could be replaced. And actually, in that case, it was better that we, we uh, waited because it's likely that now we're going to be able to get the authority to pay for some of that roadway repaving. Um, and then, you know, if there's uh, things that we, we are doing with PICO or other entities, we try to coordinate them to the greatest extent possible. However, they only really plan year to year, um, so that can get very hard um, to, to get kind of a long-term uh, planning from them. So this is the breakdown. Uh, State Liquid Fuels Fund, so this is where we're going after, like, the, worst, the, the roadways in the worst conditions. Um, they're going to be indicated in a red color in the map that's going to be on the next slide, 2.67 miles. And then about a quarter mile each of authority paving after sewer and water main replacement. Um, Pico, they're going to, they paved about two miles last year, uh, or I'm sorry, PennDOT paved about two miles last year, but Pico this year is going to pave about um, two miles. And PennDOT's been pretty attentive uh, lately in terms of our state roads, so I'm not sure uh, what Pottstown roadways might be on the list for PennDOT, but, you know, Hanover Street was paved recently and High Street was paved recently. Uh, those are some of the main ones. Whoops. So um, here's the map um, that you know, shows the red being the roadways that the borough is covering. The dashed lines are the... Are the, are the PICO ones, and then the green and blue are the authority. And, of course, we try to coordinate all these, all these together. Uh, the PICO work is related to gas uh, main installation. And the one that you see on High Street there, um, that one is going to be uh, going on for about a month. That will end on the end, the, end of, the end of March. And we will um, basically, there won't be any lanes closed for that. 
uh, lanes will be redirected. Um, once they're done for the day, I think their hours are going to be between 7 and 3, and this should be for mostly all their projects. They're going to fill those trenches with cold patch, so everything will be drivable at the end of the day. We've been working with PICO and um, made sure that they prioritize this one on, on High Street and, and up to Hanover because we've got a lot of events that are coming up in the spring, parades, street closures, and stuff like that. So we wanted to make sure that we... Um, prioritized that and got that out of the way. We also had Pico reach out to the gravity racing because as you see, Wilson Street is slated to be dug up. We have we don't have anything from the, the soapbox yet in terms of uh, street closure requests from them, um, but we've advised them of what their normal schedule is and Pico is trying to work around their schedule to make sure it wouldn't impact that. Um, another area that's been a big area of concern is Grace Street. Um, so that's up in the northern uh, section of town. And this roadway is probably, you know, there's, we rate them one through five or six. This roadway is probably like a 10 at this point in, in terms of rating. And the reason is, is because we were waiting for environmental uh, approval from the county uh, on uh, the, that, the, the stormwater project that was county funded. So unfortunately, we had to wait two years. We're finally now just getting the environmental approval uh, because we need to replace uh, stormwater inlets and piping on that road through a county funded project. So we were waiting to get that project done, um, which we actually hope to have a bit a, uh, a bit award in the next month or two on that uh, so that we can get the stormwater work in and then come behind it and pave it. So um, I know that's just been a point of pain for some of Trinita's um, constituents and just know that we're we're working on it and we're sorry but it's going to be a lot better than it was before and dealing with the, all these stormwater issues now means that we're going to be able to uh, not have to pave that roadway for a longer period of time because it's going to hold up better um, so that's one other area that I want to point out another area that I want to point out is Mervine Street that's up on the north end we're doing a joint project there because half of that roadway is owned by Lower Potts Grove Township and half is owned by the borough. Um, so we'll be signing an agreement with them. Um, Lower is going to take the lead on that project, and then we're going to reimburse them for, the, for half the cost of that roadway up there. But we do that, and we try to coordinate with the other municipalities so that we don't get the seam in the middle of the road, and, uh, which can cause it to degrade a lot faster. Um, and also it just looks kind of silly if half the road's paved and the other half isn't just because it's on a municipal boundary. Like us municipal geeks understand that, but the residents, they don't understand why that happens and it just makes everybody look bad. So we wanted to take care of that for them. Um, let's see, there's uh, two more college drive that's going to get done. Um, that's in really bad shape this, uh, you know, these past couple years. So uh, that's a bulk of our funding um you know probably about 30 or 40 percent of our funding is going to pave college drive because it's so wide mm -hmm. and then um lastly i just want to touch on shoemaker so we had paved the upper half of shoemaker road a couple years ago i think mm -hmm. and um we had some main issues there that we were working on fixing um but we wanted to wait until chipotle and panera got done because of all the construction in the area. So now we'll be coming behind them. We'll have a nice new area that'll look nice and fresh up there um, for for that development. So thank you. Yeah. So that's that's all in the works. And obviously if you have questions about other roadways, um, we'd be we'd be happy to try to try to answer them um, when we get to the end here. But um, so we got 19 miles of alleys. What, what funding do we, do we have left for that? It really, really not much because state liquid fuels funds will not fund paving of uh, alleyways because most of the alleyways are not ordained streets. So, um, but um, we do try to help out by filling potholes, leveling out if a resident uh, requests us. Really, this time of the year is kind of our prime time for getting out there and doing that kind of work. So if you have something, please feel free to reach out, and um, we can get someone to come out and address it. Um, but there are some grant funding funding sources that are out there for alternate paving. 
techniques and over the years um, we've presented before we've done um, recycled millings um, basically the millings that get taken off the road we keep those and we, what we do is reuse them to fill in alleys and level them out so um, we've been doing that each year and then also several years ago we did a driving surface aggregate project um, we are trying to look for um, another driving sur surface aggregate project that could be funded here in the next couple of years as well, but we don't have anything lined up for this year. But all reports are is that's holding up very well for us, and I think uh, Doug and yeah. Public Works is uh, very happy with that yeah. so far. Um, but one of the things if a homeowner, um, since they are unordained a homeowner, um, you know, technically uh, would be able to, uh, with the borough's permission, split the cost for improving the alley with some of their neighbors So, um, and bring in a paving contractor. There's two main things that they would need to do in order to do that. They need to obtain a free permit um, from Public Works. And what we are really looking for there is that we're not changing grading um, because uh, the alleys were never graded when they were put in. That means that um, any change to the grade that we put in there can cause stormwater issues for properties, garages, houses, uh, basements, things of that nature. So we need to make sure that there's there's not um, any changes to the way that the paving is sloped so that it doesn't cause any adverse um, impacts. And then all the property owners should have a written agreement um, with all the adjoining property owners of where the work is being completed, basically, that they complete. And that's something that we could kind of help them help them through. Uh, with, with with our uh, solicitor so um, but the main you know the main point is is that you know under the law all those adjoining neighbors have the rights to use the alley to access their property they don't have the right to block the alley so if somebody's blocking an alley that's a problem and and they should call the police um, potholes again our state we we're, we're subject to a lot a lot of freeze and thaw um, it, it, it's prime for potholes and as I mentioned, you know, we're out there um, now uh, until late spring out there using cold patch to fill our potholes. In that similar vein, um, if you do need a, a, a service requested, a pothole filled, an alley looked at, um, or any of the other items listed here, an issue with a street light, traffic light, um, trash or recycling, water, sewer, uh, we, we ask you to go to our home page and click on our request service button. Um, we just added a couple new uh, items to that, so you can now report property maintenance, you can report permit concerns, and you can report uh, vehicles to us there. Um, this system we rolled out last year has been working very well for us because it ensures that we get all the appropriate information that we need from a resident. Sometimes a resident will call with an issue and leave a voicemail and then by the time we get to the end of the voicemail, we realize they never gave us their address. So we're not able to help you unless you give us all the appropriate information and having a standardized way to fill this out um, where it requires you to fill out that information will ensure that your request gets answered more timely. Um, we also have automated the routing of these requests so that the appropriate staff members get sent. Um, so if the streets issue, you know, that'll get sent to Public Works. If it's a property maintenance issue, that'll get sent right to the staff that are working on that in L&I. Um, it'll also give you a receipt of the um, rep approved request. And if there's a third party involved, like um, for trash and recycling, um, a lot of times your request will get uh, sent right to JP Mascaro, in a, uh, their root supervisor, in addition to uh, Public Works, so that that way, if they're out there, they might only be a block away. So if they get that email, they get it real time, and um, they might be able to come back and service you a lot, a lot sooner. So this just shows where to find it on the website. Um, it's a big button in the bottom on the bottom left, and then on the right there, you can kind of see once you click onto that um, button, you'll see the items that you can select, and basically some of the information that we're asking for. Um, and this is for a, a streets request, so. What is the location of the service issue being reported? What is your address? Um, and is it uh, what is the issue with this with the street? Is it a pothole location? And then is the pothole location <clears throat> on the street or is it on the on the alley? Um, because we don't have named alleys, we realize we've got to put in this um, alley question because you know if it's 
one two three Chestnut Street um, Alley. There's no address for that, so um, we have that in there for Alley if, it, if if that's an issue. But there's other things, debris on street, missing street signs, a lot of different stuff. So that's the way we'd like you to do it. You can also email Public Works or call Public Works at the contacts here. Yeah. And then again, to make any requests for PennDOT roads. Uh, you can uh, log into pendot.gov and click on submit roadway feedback or call 1 800 fix road. So at this point, I'd be happy to take uh, any uh, questions that you have for us. On that last screen, um, where you pick all the issues that you have, um, is, is, is there the ability to pick multiple issues, or do you want the person to uh, do a separate um, input for each, for each issue? Yes, yeah, so we have that pretty much automated in the system. It, it won't let if, if 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 we allow you to pick multiple issues, it'll be a square box, so you can right. see the square box there. If we allow you to pick only one issue, it'll be a circle. So you're either a, like in the rental unit question, you're either a tenant or an owner. You're, you, you know, you can't be both. So yeah, so you can pick multiple where where it's indicated there. Not talking about the service requests. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Is that what you're talking about? Okay. Yeah, the service requests. Yep. Okay. Yep. So, 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 so someone has multiple requests and they have to do two separate requests? Not necessarily, but possibly. Yeah. It depends on what the request is. Yep. Well, if they can only pick one, then they would have to do another request. If, they have two. if it's a different location, <laughs> yes. Yeah, if it's a different location, they would, they would need to put in another request. That's correct. Justin, I have a quick question. For us, do you want, when we get reports from residents who don't want to do this or have done this and whatever, they're not going to do it or they want us to report it, do you want us to go through there or email? What's better for? It's it's better for everyone to go through go through there because if um, this will get emailed actually to the person that's like in the, I don't want to say like in the trenches, but in, you know, on, on the ground working on this day to day, like this is their job to address these calls. Is it linked it, to your login though? No, no, no login required. Okay. Nope. It's free. It's open to anyone. Um, you know, we are working on also getting uh, photos to be able to be uploaded on there as mm. well. So people can send in a photo. Nice. So that's something we're working on. But yeah, because what happens is an email, uh, you know, we'll send it to that person, but if I'm on vacation or if Doug's on vacation, it's not going to get to the people that are actually doing that work until we return. So this is really going to be the quickest and fastest way to advise people to do it, but they don't have to do it that way. It's just they're going to get a better response that way. But would you prefer us to, meaning council, me, um, yes. to report those? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And if, now, if, if you're having an issue with getting that addressed, mm -hmm. then you need to talk to me. Yeah. Okay, well, let me pick it back up. let me pick it back off of that then. Um, does that eliminate the counselor's request? I'm not sure what the question is. Can you clarify that? Our counselor's request forms that we have when we need something done, does that does this eliminate that? From years ago. Yeah, we haven't used yeah. those in years. I, I don't know. think so. I, it, it, I, I still call. I still call in and do mine. But right, right, yeah. Yeah, so you wouldn't you wouldn't need to use that form now, no. Okay. So this software geek calls those radio buttons and then multi check boxes. Oh great. <laughs> yes, radial and multi, yes. Like when you talk about municipal. Yeah, stuff. apparently that's what very well known that that's what those buttons mean. But uh, not everyone knows that. So thank you. Yeah. I was just giving you a hard time. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Um, if there are any questions about the paving. Uh, we're hoping to get this all finalized by Monday um, and get the bids out uh, next week. So uh, let us know by then. Otherwise, we're going to move forward with the plans that you have now. Okay? Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. You're next. I think um, we've got another presentation. This? Yeah. 
Pottstown Community Arts, sir. Hi. Hi. I'm Marie of Pottstown Community Arts, in case you don't know me. Um, so <laughs> we did, last year, you guys approved um, us to come down and make several of the tree well boxes. Mm -hmm. Ryan will remember, he helped haul the wood. And uh, it was <laughs> wonderful. So we were able to get several of those installed. I don't remember exactly how many. It was a really hot day. Wonderful. But we got those installed, and what we'd like to do is continue that project, is to continue to working on, the, on that block. Um, last year for, for the planter uh, competition that Pate always um, hosts, we uh, organ organized, yeah, organized um, a lot of the kids in town to make all these beautiful ornaments to go right in front of the Fridas, which is what started, not that I'm rambling, which is what jumped off this idea, is to work in that same area to help make it a more homey, welcoming, vibrant spot um, on High Street uh, without having to buy those um, lovely planters that are uh, closer to here. So what we want to do, what we're proposing is to fill in more plants along um, in the tree wells that we put in, but as well as in some of the existing tree wells. So this is right on the corner of Washington and High, and there are some older tree wells that we didn't create, but they're there and they're empty. And it would be so nice if they weren't empty. And we could bring some more color and hopefully evergreen so it looks great all year round. But not just that. If you could zip over to the next slide. Thank you. And so there's a, <laughs> there's a, a relic to my day. See, I'm really old. And that is an old pay phone that we used to call home on. Um, <laughs> collect calls. And this one, Some exactly, people don't know calls. that. <laughs> I'm with you. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> and right now it has graffiti on it, and it doesn't look amazing. So what we'd like to do is make it look amazing. Um, I'm sure the pay company that installed it there has just abandoned it, uh, and it looks abandoned. So we'd like to make it more loved upon. Um, so that's one of our ideas to, again, just bring more color down to this neck of the woods, down to this corner. And if you could zip over to the last one, this is our, our largest idea. So there, and I know that that bottom picture is not quite right. That shows Wells Fargo or the old Wells Fargo building in the background. But what we'd actually like to do is move that painting and make it an intersection mural. Um, move it into the middle, obviously in the middle of the intersection, hence the name, in the middle of, the, of Washington and High. So when you're driving down High Street, this will actually welcome you into the downtown area. It would be such like a bright color um, and such an amazing welcome sign, but not really a sign, but more of a, a mural. It was designed by uh, Karavi Kolkarni. Um, she used to live in this area. Um, I know her from my mom's club days. So when the kids were little, we were in this mom's club, and it was, I don't need to regale you with that story. That's not the important part. Anyway, <laughs> she was, um, oh, she's a wonderful artist. She's since moved to media, but her heart is still here. This is where her, when her children were little, they. They were here and growing up, and so she has some of her roots still here, and she would love to come back and paint that. And as you see, the second picture, this one. Mm -hmm. That was when um, I invited her down. Uh, we do the Sidewalk Chalk Festival every year. Now we uh, do it with um, the carousel. Um, but that was a year that we did it right on High Street, and that is the inspiration for the intersection mural. It will require us shutting down High Street and we would have to 
file all that paperwork with, with the borough, and that would be fine. Um, but this this is our bright idea. Sorry, it would actually be the state. It's a oh. State road. Yep. Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's above us. It might take a little bit longer than I have imagined, <laughs> but we'll get it. <laughs> you got enthusiasm. <laughs> We're going to get it. Um, but this, this whole block... Like, if you can envision in my mind, last year we put in the tree wells, we painted the benches right in front of Sydney Pollock House, um, and so then across the street we're going to add more color through the payphone, through the plantings, and then it's going to be right in the middle of the road is going to be the mandala um, mural, and then if you keep turning... <laughs> Here I am turning. But if you keep turning, like behind me, we're filling in the murals behind the library, and we're working on that with some of the youth in town. So it's just all together. Um, and I know that maybe the art is not what you would like, or you would not put that in your house, but that's not what it's about. It's about bringing the community together, and it's about showcasing the art that's here, and it's about welcoming people to the downtown area. Um, and I'm not going to read this entire letter. It's lovely. But this is paid supporting us on this project. And I just wanted to read a bit. And I can definitely leave it in your hands if it hasn't already been. I'm sure Ms. Danette has already sent this to you. She's phenomenal. Um, so. And she said, as we look to the physical improvement and placemaking initiatives in Pottstown downtown district, Pay believes beautification improvements such as this one will generate future investment and Paid is happy to support Pottstown Community Arts as they, oh yes, we're submitting this application into the Love Your Block Pots, uh, uh, grant that Community action, pass on community action, always hosts. Um, and so we're hoping for their support. And if we don't get it, we will simply charge on ahead. Um, and to be used to an artistic project within the 400 block of High Street. And so this artwork will make it more visual and bring more pride to the 400 block and welcome visitors and to the residents in the downtown district. And Thank you for the opportunity to show this, and I'm, I'm very excited. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. I, I got a question. <laughs> I, I, got, I, I, love, I love all of that, and yeah. I, I especially love your spirit. You know I love your spirit. <laughs> Thank you, too. I do. I love the energy. <laughs> um, the pay phones, I love those. They have them in the city. When do you they go in really? the hood, yeah. If you go they in the work. hood, the kids do they paint. paint them like we're gonna paint? No, them? not like that. Oh, but they, they just get different colors <laughs> and flowers and everything on there. <laughs> also, when you paint the mural, can I ask that whatever paint you use, yes, make sure it's for cars, like for tires, because I drive a bus and they have one in Norristown, and you have to coast it because if you stop, it make the bus go duh, 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 and it makes the bus slide and you can't stop it. <gasps> So I want to just bring that to your attention Thank because you. cars, it, it cars, it does that to cars too. So um, if you do the mural, if it have, I don't know, um, I can add tire does. paint I got um, I'll put traction. Sand in it. I don't know what you. I don't know. That's your thing. I got it. Yeah. But so, thank you. I yes. appreciate that. So yes, if you can just make sure that it that if we stop on it, cars, buses, trucks, whatever, that it. <laughs> That we can stop on it because the Black Lives Matter mural is 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 dangerous. It's in Norristown, right there by the new courthouse. It's not there yet. That's they that they're okay. building. But yes, it's right there, and we go down, and you you have to coast it, or you have to stop before it. So or... I bet the sealant's slick. We can fix it. I got it. Yep. So that's Thank all. You. That's all. That's all I have. Thank you, Janita. So uh, Marie, what do you need from from us? Your blessing. I really just need to know that we can put the plants in where we would like to. We can paint that payphone. That okay. I think that's something that we would have jurisdiction to do. Right, mm -hmm. and then the mandala. I need to work through the they, state. Mm -hmm. I think you should get with Teresi with that one. Mm -hmm. I should get. Go with, to, I think you should go to Joe and see how Joe's that could Teresi. work. Joe's how that state work. rep. Okay. Oh. Yes, thank you. Now, I know exactly who but you mean. Thank we, you. Yeah, when we got to the, 
But depending yes. on what they say, um, <clears throat> when we got to the point of the road closure, we could help you out there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank yeah. you very much. Yep. Yay, Marie, you did a good job. All right, Pottstown Rotary Clubs with the July Parade. Um, yes, so they are planning to start this at 1015 at Goodwill uh, and then run down to Manitani and then they'll um, disband there as well. Okay, we'll list that for Monday. Uh, environmental Consultation Services, Apollo Park. Yes, so because we have uh, PADEP, um, grant uh, funding with this they're requiring an RFP for professional service for the environmental uh, consultation so we're currently um, interviewing three firms right now and we'll have a recommendation for you on Monday night you'll have one mm -hmm. okay we'll list it 18 uh, zoning application for 502 hail mr. Garner uh, yeah thank you Dan the next the next three are all applications that have been filed and hearings are pending before the zoning hearing board um, these are for information purposes for you if you wish to take a position. Uh, 502 Hale Street is currently a vacant lot. It's just over 6,000 square feet. Uh, a land development plan has been submitted. Um, the plan shows a four unit apartment building. Um, however, the proposal does not meet the zoning ordinance. They are asking for a number of variants all relate in my view to the size of the building they're proposing um, they're looking for uh, variants for rear yard setback relief uh, the overall size of the building the building height and the location parking spaces as they relate to the location of Hale Street so they're all dimensional variances that have to do with the fact that they're proposing a, a two-story apartment building with four units. Mm -hmm. um, that's being heard by the Zoning Hearing Board 19th, and if Council take any position, you're welcome to do that. Can I go to the next yep. one? Yep, go ahead. Um, the next one is at 223 Shoemaker Road. That is the Pottstown Center, and in particular, it's a vacant building now it used to be the uh, Boston Market site and a urgent care veterinarian wants to uh, occupy the building uh, this relief solely relates to signage um, as I I think the application the packet is a pretty detailed sign package the variances that they would need relate to the number of signs they're seeking the maximum sign area and the fact that the uh, window signage exceeds the 25% of the glass size. So um, they're looking for relief from the signage. That's in HB district. Um, so if you want to take a position or not, you can. And the last one, I don't think that hearing has been scheduled. That's 1501. I Street, I think Peggy alluded to that earlier. Uh, that is high and Beach Street intersection. There is a uh, pharmacy building that's on the property that's the primary use. They're requesting uh, some type of permanent food truck to be placed on the property um, for business seven days a week. Um, there's problems with that with zoning because there's two uh, two uses unrelated on the site it would need zoning relief the food truck is not an accessory use to the pharmacy obviously and depending on the location of the food truck that on the site could impact parking existing parking requirements for the pharmacy so uh, those are the items looking for relief for that parcel okay. i'm happy to answer any questions i think you should have uh, the applications in your packet with all of the details. Any questions? I believe the, um, the, the, the 502 Hale and 1501 higher in the seventh ward and 223 Shoemakers in the second ward. Okay. Yes, they are. 
list them for Monday. Dan, with your permission, we'll list as possible motions and then council can decide if they want to take any action. Is that okay? That's correct. Okay, very good. All right, thank you. 21 uh, the Pottstown Play Streets. We have a list. Yep, it's back know. again this year, uh, July 10th, July 17th, July 24th, July 31st, August 7th, August 14th. Um, the lo reminder, location will be posted um, prior to the event. Um, but uh, we should have the dates out there soon for everyone to get on their calendars. Okay, so put that on for Monday. Uh, 22 and 23, we, both the non-uniform and uniform pension assets moving. Yeah, so both of these items I can kind of cover because both pension boards decided to do the both, uh, both do the same thing. Um, there's two uh, methods of valuation that can be applied for a, a pension um, per actuarial and other regulations governing pensions, and those are a snapshot date approach and a smoothing date approach. So traditionally, the boroughs, both the boroughs' pensions, their valuations were based on a snapshot date. So that provides an immediate but potentially volatile assessment of the fund's financial health. The borough's snapshot date was in January of 2022. This occurred when the market was more than 30% lower than what it is today. And um, if we were to use this snapshot date, the borough would have to come up with $1.4 million in 2025 to fund both the police and the uh, non-uniform pension. So, um, you know, one thing that helps with this kind of big jump is asset smoothing, which spreads out the market fluctu fluctuation over a longer period of time. In our case, it'll be spread out over five years, so it'll offer a more stable and predictable evaluation of the pension fund status. Um, you know, the snapshot date might be a more clear way to do it, but as we've seen, it exposes the fund to short-term mar market volatility, whereas smoothing mitigates the vol volatility. So both uh, um, pensions have proved a shift towards smoothing um, for 2025 and beyond um, due to the predictability and um, the cost savings that uh, the borough will be able to gain from that. Any questions? Okay, questions? <laughs> All right, we'll list that for approval for Monday. <clears throat> uh, paid street test. You see that test? Yes, so we have that. They're just looking for the third. Um, it's three events, um, right? Three? Third sun, sun, Saturday of the third month. Third Saturday. Um, 200 block will be closed 12 to 7 p.m. Okay. We'll lose that. Uh, 25, Red Horse Motoring Club. Welcome back. Can we have, can we talk about these street closure requests a little bit? Okay. Um, I've been noticing that people are trying to create economic interest in this town and bring a lot of people into this town. And I see that there's costs involved with closing the streets. Um, when I was little, my father used to say to me, when I would do something that didn't really make a lot of sense, which was, Andrew, you're stepping over a quarter to get to a nickel. We are charging people, organizations that are trying to bring business into the town, the economic factor, the economic impact that these things have. And we're hit, hitting them up with street closure, uh, police, barricades at, you know, ten dollars Would you like everybody to stop? Would you like them to stop coming? Okay, because we could, you wouldn't have to worry about the $2,000, but you wouldn't have to worry about the people coming in. I, I think we should look at, number one, take a hard look at the costs associated with, with, with that, okay, and make sure that they are, if we're charging them, that they are actually necessary. For example, uh, is there studies that say that when we have the car show or the paid fest or whatever, that there is an increase in the amount of police work that's necessary? 
if that's the case and there's a correlation, there's studies done, then maybe there's a reason to have a cost associated with these things. But if we're just saying, what the heck, you know, got a couple policemen out there, put some barricades up, I think it's short-sighted. I think it's short-sighted, and I think it, it um, will, we will find that we will have less and less of these things the more we start charging people for bringing people into our town. So I think we should look at that. And for whatever metric or formula that you use to calculate what you would like to take from these org organizations that aren't charging a cent to bring these people into town, I think you might want to re-examine the metric and see if you can come up with something reasonable. And this isn't the first time I've said this. And what I saw was $2,000 permit fees. It's going to hit Red Horse for 10 grand. Why would you do it? They're just trying to bring people into the town. If we don't want to bring people into the town, just let us know. We, we, we can make it higher. Can I ask? Trying to bring people into town. Question? Sure. It's just a question. Don't throw anything at me. I'm tired. Not yet. I'm getting ready. <laughs> Hold on. Has organizations brought complaints to you about the fees? Oh, of course, yes. Okay. Of course. Yes. 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 I'm the sound box. Okay. People come to yell. Okay. So, yes, they have. And they are not happy about it. As a matter of fact, the. You know, the prices went up significantly. Again, they're bringing people into the town. It's a good thing, isn't it? I mean, you may not like the car shows. It may not be your cup of tea. So are you just talking specifically about the car show? Oh, no, I'm talking about anybody. I'm talking about the street fest, whatever the, whatever the, 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 uh, the street fest for the, for the, the, oh. play, the play fest. Yeah. Oh. The play streets. The play, the play fest. The play fest may not be... Would not be, you know, Red Horse's uh, car show, What's but it certainly it, it'll be something. But there's not going to be as many people, so the cost shouldn't be as high. I don't even know how these costs are generated. They just are generated. I just want to clarify that these costs aren't just made up out of thin air to generate money for the borough. These costs are to cover um, the cost of our overtime for police officers and public works staff. So um, the bigger question I think you're asking is, is should we incentivize these uh, events by having the taxpayers cover some of the costs for these events? Because either, either the event organizer pays for it, the taxpayers pay for it, or we get a gift from maybe the county commissioners and they pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know where I can't find them anymore. But. So, no, no, I, so they're I, real costs. I mean, I can assure you that we've we've looked at it, we've we've vetted it, um, and uh, quite frankly, for events uh, like the car show that draw in a lot of people, we need to have police presence there. It's not even a question. And the Fourth of July. Um, mm -hmm. it, 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 and, and it's a result of what this society has evolved to, and and what we need to be careful about. Um, in these events. So, um, you know, for a long time we didn't charge um, what, what we are charging now. What changed? For the police officers. Well, well, what changed is that society changed once, one, for one. Um, for two, the car shows got a lot bigger, which is a great thing, right? Right, yeah. But we were able to, the best way I can explain this is that before we were, we were able to cover this with the officers that we have on shift. We were able to cover it. It was manageable. I mean, but that meant that if there was a call or something, you know, big that was happening in the borough, those officers got called out of that event and they went to the call. Mm -hmm. What we're saying now is because of the size of, of some of these events and because of what's going on with society today, we're no longer 
comfortable doing that, and these shows need police coverage. And and if they had to, and if they decided that they're not comfortable anymore with paying this, and they don't want to have this anymore, would we be sad or would be we be happy? Well, I think you know the answer to that. Yeah, nobody know, nobody yes. wants to see yeah. nobody wants to see that happen. So the real question is: is does the borough want to cover? These these costs. Do they want to work together with? Do they want to work with of, people who are bringing instead of passing the thing? costs on to the event? So that's really the question. Right. Do you want? Do you want to work? Do we want to encourage people to have giant shows that will bring lots and lots of people into this town to spend money? Okay, at the various establishments. Okay, and and see what a wonderful town we have from. The beginning from Manitowney Street to Arm and Hammer Boulevard, we have a beautiful, beautiful town with unbelievable assets. And we are getting these people to come in here and see them. And they will come back. And they will come back. And Red Horse people don't want anything for it. They're just having a car show. They like cars. This is the thing to do. What I'm saying is, is that it should be a two way street. The conversation shouldn't just be, this is what you're going to pay, okay? It should be, how can we work together, okay? Because if they're bringing thousands of people in and they, and they say, well, you know what? We're not going to do five shows. We're going to do three. It's a lot of economic hurt or an economic loss that came to the borough and, and lost income. I'm just saying... I'm just saying you might want to think about that. You might want to just be, uh, and that's for, that's for the street fest, that's for, that's for people who are bringing people into this town. We like that. We don't have the money in the police budget, though, to pay for overtime for all of these events, though. So my understanding is what Justin's saying is it, these are hard costs, and they have to be paid by someone. So either... Somebody starts a GoFundMe page or a fundraiser or council pays for it. It's got to come from somewhere. And point. if you give, you know, if you make an exception for one, then where do you stop? And this is why. I said for all. I said you're bringing, you're bringing, you're closing, we're bringing people into town. Are you going to pay for the overtime? Am no. I going? What kind of question is that? Like, no, no, I'm like, not. Go, no, I am not going to pay for the overtime. Okay, what's going to happen is, is that one or two things could happen. What happens in many in many jobs in many companies where you are short staffed, you make it work. You make it work. And from what I have, and from what I have understood, huh? safety issue though this is not a make it work so is there so tell me do you know then how many safety issues we have had during these car shows i've had uh, yeah <coughs> i do okay I, I would like to know what would have happened like uh, what uh, how many more calls occur on those days than on other days do you guys want to talk about this later Yes, I was going to say that because, guys, I have to get up at 1.30 and, and drive a bus. Okay, yes, so I need to, I need to. <laughs> Maybe we make it an agenda item and have a discussion. Yes, we can do that, yes. Cool. Can we do that, please? Yeah, whatever. It'd be better you more lively than the ones I've tried to. You know, in small groups. And, yeah, and we'll do that. I mean, because. I got to go. I'm tired. Anyone else? Fine. Okay. I'm okay with that. Just okay. have a conversation about it. Because yeah, yeah, I don't want these things to go away. <laughs> not about this. I'm not up for a fight. Well, we just okay. wanna... Fine. We've agreed to have conversations yeah. about it. Awesome. And as far as the approval of this list... Yeah, so I mean, the important thing that people should know, there's a couple changes to the Red, Har Red Horse uh, car show this year. Uh, they'd like to move the time up to um, 1 p.m., um, which I think is a change from 4, uh, 4 p.m., which they had typically done. Right. And they also want to expand um, the high street roadway closure to go um, from currently stops at Manitani, it would go all the way down to College Drive. Mm -hmm. um, we sense. met with them and um, talked to them about this, and I think that the PD feels that the, the College Drive is actually a lot safer of a place to start it due to some site distance issues at Manitani Street, so. Okay, so that. Okay. That is what we'll list for Monday. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Uh, we have an opening in EAC for a three-year term to expire August 10, 2024. Any, anyone yet? No. Okay, no applicants for that. That brings us to our, our citizens with comments. Mm -hmm. All right, first up we have um, Carol uh, Rachel. Um, you here, Carol? No. Uh. Okay, next we have Lena Devlin. Good evening. Thank you for letting me speak tonight. Um, I am here to talk about, and I don't mean to like bring any ire up, Oops. the car show specifically. Um, I am representing Steel River Playhouse, and one of the things that is very true of theater is that we have to do a lot of planning. For instance, this month, we're planning next year. So last year, when we did planning, we knew that the car show was going to be here the first Saturday of every month and that the parking would be unavailable to our patrons starting at 4 p.m. So um, on the first Saturday of June this year, we're doing the prom, which is very exciting. And um, typically, we would have two performances on that day. But because of the car show, we knew that it would not be convenient for our patrons to try to park for an evening performance because the car show was here. So we, we, we cut that out of our schedule. We canceled it, essentially. And we scheduled one show to start at noon so that the show could start at noon and that our patrons could be gone and out and the parking would be fine. The problem, of course, is that we just heard yesterday that we now have to uh, clear the streets at one, which means our patrons would literally be in the theater watching the show, and therefore their cars would be towed, or we have to tell everybody they can't park on High Street. And I 100% agree that we need to have events to bring people into town. Still River brings 20,000 visits to Pottstown a year. And uh, for instance, for the prom, that's one of our full-scale musicals. Typically, we would do 11 performances over three weeks. Because of the car show and the way it needed to get scheduled, we went down to 10. Mm -hmm. And if we have to now cancel the one that is on June 1st, because the car show parking change that we just found out about yesterday is moving forward three hours, that's another performance we're losing, which could be up to $10,000 for the Playhouse. We can't afford to lose that kind of money. It could really hurt us. So anyway, I'm just here to really talk about the fact that for sure we understand these events are important. I'm, it's not that I'm not supporting the car show. I'm not <clears throat> supporting a change of three hours of parking this late in the game. Mm -hmm. um, I, we just found out yesterday, and this has been planned for a year. Now we have, in August, we're planning on doing a show, a teen show, and there will be one running on August 3rd. To be fair, we haven't scheduled those yet, mm -hmm. so we, if the car show was gonna be getting here on the, you know, no parking after four, we would get that, we would do it early in the day, and then we would be done. Mm -hmm. Now, does that mean we can't schedule one on that day in August? That's a teen show. So it's just one of those things, theater and many businesses need more than just a couple of months time. We just need to understand exactly what's going on so we can schedule accordingly and talk to our patrons because we have to pay for these shows a year in advance. I mean, it's a lot of planning and a lot of work. Yeah. So I just want to make sure that everybody's aware if we make these changes late in the game, it has a really negative impact on lots of people. Mm -hmm. Did I miss anything? Okay. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next up is... Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Justin. Uh, could you call a meeting between Red Horse and uh, the theater? Well, I would encourage the theater to reach out to Red Horse. Yeah, you, know, yeah, you guys are sitting right so. next to each other and see absolutely. what can be worked <laughs> right out. I mean, we're yeah. happy to broker that, but this is yeah. really, you know. Absolutely. You know, if, they, like if, if you want to they want to close the street at 1 o'clock, you can start that at the West End. And, and I don't know what time the 12 o'clock show be. lets out. But yeah. that might so that they aren't that prepping result. that end of the street. The east end of the street until. Yeah. Peggy's trying to get your attention. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, thank uh, you for having me. I'm Dan Glenn, and I'm re here to represent Red Horse. Yeah. Hey, oh, next. okay. Thank you. Um, when I came here tonight, uh, I wasn't aware that there was going to be a lot of talk about Red Horse in, in particular, other than the, the request for an earlier opening. Um, uh, Councilman Manastra mentioned some figures, and I just wanted to bring those up as well. 
I understand that Steel River brings a lot of people into town and that their performances are planned a year in advance. Equally, everyone was aware, including uh, Steel River, that the first Saturday of every month in the summertime essentially is a car show. And that's why they had removed one of the shows to their detriment and only was going through with the, um, the matinee. I only found out today that they only found out yesterday about our permit that was filed, and it does create a, a really an insurmountable in inconvenience for them, as is right now. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Weyand, I think that you, you presented something that we loosely had talked about, but more specifically, if instead of uh, closing the entirety of the street at that time, we allowed for uh, parking in front of Seal River, four or five spots that are there, and allowed them to park there at noon, and I would tell the police, please don't ticket or tow anyone until 3.30. That would essentially address their concern directly. The parking lots have always been available to them, and they'll continue to be available to them, including the one behind New York Plaza. So that's that. the entrance to that could be uh, along Queen Street that uh, empties onto Hanover. Penn Street is... Um, usually blocked by a stage, and I understand there was some concern about walking back to cars that are in that lot. In the two hours that we've waited here in the first 30 minutes we talked about it, I contacted Harry Dean. I said, any problem with moving the stage more toward the center of High Street so that people could walk around the stage down to Penn Street? The answer was no problem. Uh, so no problem on the stage, no problem with us postponing the enforcement of the, the uh, parking or closure for the space in front of Steel River. As far as I'm concerned, this little bit of talking seemed to have uh, solved everything. Um, going forward, the reason that we did request, and, and for the, the balance of the season, the reason that we did request the permits to be issued starting at 1 p.m. is actually for safety reasons. When we have people driving in, setting up, putting up um, uh, marquees as they do for outdoor entertainment and sales, it's not safe to have active cars or cars actively coming in and out and up and down High Street while people are walking around setting up not just the cars but also vending sites. Um, we have approximately 850 to 1,000 cars every first Saturday of the month from May through September, through October, I'm sorry. Uh, we bring about three to 4,000 people per car show into town. It's difficult for me to comprehend the economic impact because I don't think that there's any metric prior to us doing this sort of show. I don't think that the old uh, uh, cruises were anything like this. I do think that those three to 4,000 people eat, drink, and recreate in Pottstown. To Mr. Monaster's point, I think that they also see Pottstown. They see that it's on its best days in the summertime, people walking around in the street with their children, with their, their elderly parents, with their friends, and they have a good time. This is, some, this is a good for Pottstown. I'd like to facilitate everyone being at least accommodated on this slight inconvenience or this inconvenience that occurred because of a, a scheduling that happened a year ago. Uh, but going forward, I think that it is dangerous not to allow us to close the street on, at one o'clock. Now, again, I don't want to adversely impact anyone's progress or economic uh, viability, but I, it's difficult for me to believe that three or 4,000 people don't positively impact Pottstown in so many ways. Um, that's really all I have. I am open for questions, though, if, if any of you have any questions about... Oh, the other thing is, it costs Red Horse Motoring Club about $8,000 a year at the current permit rate, which was reduced from 2000 to 1600 um, That does not include things like uh, porta-potties, marketing, Volunteer labor, of course, is not charged for, but we could, we could account for that if we had to show what the economic value of that is. That's out of pocket. The three owners of Red, Red Horse don't make money at Red Horse enough to offset this, and it comes out of their pockets. So why do we do it for Potsdam? Because we really like it here, and we really want to stay, and we really can't afford it. And, and working together, I guess that's my thought. Battery went dead. Sorry. <laughs> you are at your five minutes, but if you want to finish that thought. <laughs> All right, great. So um, looks like we have uh, Tom Nyros up next, and you're going to have to use the microphone on the table. So you live in town? Yeah. I feel special now. Um, no, I just wanted to... Uh, 
Is that good? Is that good? Um, I just wanted to thank uh, the community for coming out to our first uh, coldest night of the year, 5K. Um, I want to thank Mayor Stephanie, uh, Lisa, and Trinita for coming out and showing support. Um, we had around 196 people come out, um, learn about the organization, uh, learn about Pottstown and, and our impact here in Pottstown. Um, we were able to raise over $42,000 to help with uh, providing services, operating, and continuing to pay our staff. Um, I also wanted to thank Lisa. <laughs> um, we had a, a, someone who needed to come in and utilize our warming center. It was a couple that recently became homeless and... Um, Make me cry. <laughs> well, I'm not going to make you cry. <laughs> Boots will make you cry. <laughs> Uh, they had a cat, mm -hmm. and uh, Lisa told me about a year ago if anybody ever has a cat and, and needs to be fostered so they can come into shelter, let me know. Um, so she had that cat for about a week, a week. and uh, so th she, it, it's amazing that she was uh, available, made mm -hmm. herself available, took care of that cat, um, sent texts every day with pictures, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> um, those people and the cat are now moving into uh, stable housing with their family. So it wasn't long, it was a week, and without that week, who knows what, what would have happened. So thank you, Lisa. Um, and if anything happens, I'll take that cap. <laughs> I, you, I've, you've told me that 20 times. <laughs> I'll say it again. Today. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I really just wanted to thank the community um, for coming out and supporting uh, Pottstown Beacon of Hope at our first uh, 5K. Thank you. Right, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Joshua Sounders. Hi, uh, Joshua Sounders from the very best, 252 East High Street. Um, I'd like to speak a little bit about the process for these applications. I love the car shows. Um, I love that they happen. They do bring us business, and anybody in the town, <coughs> excuse me, anybody in the town is someone that sees my shop and comes back later. Um, but uh, there's a discommunication here. Mm -hmm. I just found out about this uh, application yesterday at like 4 o'clock because one of the Red Horse members came in and was talking about it. And um, I feel that perhaps there could be a better way of doing this. Um, I don't know if it's just this one because I do see other applications come through. The Juneteenth, he's been around twice in the last two weeks just to make sure that I'm going to participate and later on just have me sign the petition. Whereas this one doesn't seem to have any from the, uh, excuse me, this one's from the Red Horse. Um, and I love the car show and I was unaware of this change, uh, but it would be nice to know. So if you look at the application on uh, signatures, they've all come from an email from paid that, uh, only said as subject line, planters and events, and a short survey. And I didn't really feel that a short survey that says, I, we welcome downtown events, including car shows, should be really qualifying for a, uh, as signatures on a petition. So I'm just asking <coughs> that, this could be done in a, more, in a better way that uh, residents would be informed as well, paid generally, <coughs> caters to the businesses, and there are plenty of residents that are in these streets that are blocked off, and when you block off a street party, you have to do 75%. I understand a car show is a little bit different, um, but it's, there's a lack of communication here, and it's something that I would like to see so I can attend these sort of things if they do affect me, in a more negative way than this, uh, this car show does. I would prefer it was a little later, but we all have to work together. So I understand that. But I'm concerned that there may be something worse coming down the line that I don't know about because I was under-informed. So I'd just like to say that if there's a way we can perhaps go back to the other way, um, proper signatures in that, that we could all you know, be way more informed. I talked to the six businesses in my block and the next block, and no one knew about it because no one have opened up a quick survey from, uh, from paid. And I didn't either. I'm a busy businessman. 
So if the, if the subject said, application, please review, or something like that, then I would definitely have opened that. So if uh, I just would appreciate a little bit more notice, is what I'm saying. And if we could do that in the future, that would really benefit us as businesses and residents. Okay. Can I say something? Oh, sure. Yes. I know we don't usually respond, but can we look at our process and making it better? It's not the first time I've heard concerns like that. It's the first time I've heard something come in so close or so late in the game. Um, but everything you just said, I've heard. So if we could just look at better communication, we have a real problem with communication sometimes. Yeah, I think that's why the purpose of this meeting tonight, yeah. to give people the opportunity, if there's concerns, to express mm -hmm. them. So if uh, you guys uh, have concerns, certainly it doesn't have to be taken up uh, uh, this month. I mean, it can wait another month so that... Well, it's just concerning that they got it yesterday, right? It was yesterday. Yeah, well, uh, to tell you the truth, um, what happened was Red Horse was in my shop and talking about the new changes that have been implemented. And he told me that it was closing the streets at noon. Now, that was a miscommunication on his part to us, but it set me in motion. After work, I ran down to the borough hall and went to the borough manager and uh, spoke to the secretary, spoke to Alexa, and uh, she said, oh, that's, uh, you need to go to see the police department. So I went down and see the police department. And I'm like, oh, no, the paid's taking care of that. So then I went up and saw paid, and she said, oh, it was an email. Um, no, sorry. The police officer said she should have gotten an email a week ago about it, which I went back, and that's when I found that it was the little quick survey on the end of that. So from tonight's meeting, I've also learned that the, uh, the street fest is closing down the block in front of my, my you have shop. You 10 seconds, sir. No, oh, sorry. Uh, so like I'm saying, I, I didn't receive what he felt was a fair notice of these, to be given a chance to uh, review them. Thank you. All right, next up we have uh, Doug Slick. It's been a long meeting. I'm going to be very brief. Uh, Commissioner DeBello, what a nice surprise to see you here today. <coughs> and bonus points for staying for the whole meeting. Yeah, yeah. that's for yeah. sure. Um, <laughs> right? It would have been very easy for you to just walk out after your statement. So. Yeah. <laughs> we appreciate it. Um, your presence and your comments actually embody comments that I've been making for the last several months about how we need to reach across levels of government and across um, barriers of NPOs and private and, and public industry um, to help address unhoused citizens. And so I appreciate that you and the other commissioners have made that such a priority. And uh, wish you luck. I'd, I'd like to help. Thank you. Um, and actually, I. The council was familiar with the fact that I like to start with a, a positive story. In fact, I, all I intended to do tonight was to just tell you the positive story. Um, and it happens to be a, a county uh, issue as well. Uh, the county has leveraged $3 million of COVID-19 money to uh, help um, avoid evictions. I don't know all the details. It just popped onto my feed uh, actually right before I came up today. Uh, so thank you for however that's been engineered. And thank you for, um, you know, involving our local uh, agency as well. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, lastly, we have Johnny Corson, please. That gentleman said it's been a long, long time. <laughs> <laughs> Almost went to sleep back there. Okay. Anyway, I come to restore the reputation of the NAACP. I participated with the march with the mayor, <laughs> oh. the homeless, and a couple of council people on that. March with her acted real, acted up real bad that day, and mm -hmm. I don't want to be lumped into that. But anyway, uh, blood drive. We talked about the blood drive at the Ricketts Center. Uh, the Red Cross is really anyway. Everybody, everybody doesn't know I'm the president of Pasan ACP. There's a lack of blood. The uh, Red Cross says, and they need it for cancer victims, uh, people who are having gun violence. Uh, victims, uh, sickle cell, and surgery. So I encourage everybody in Pottstown, please sign up for the blood drive on April 19th at the Ricketts Center. And you can make your appointments at uh, www.redcrossblood.org. And next, I'd like to say from Pottstown and the OCP, we'd like to say thank you to Mr. Joel Johnson, Mr. Howard from the Montgomery County Housing Authority, uh, Howard Brown and Craig Kalissa from Health and Wellness Foundation. The Bright Hope Playground is coming to a reality. 
And I also, NOACP, would like to say thank you to our borough council. We understand there was a couple of uh, bumps in the road to make that happen, and you guys sat down and you helped Joel smooth the road out. So, Pastor NOACP, thanks, borough council, for that. And uh, Road to Read program. Uh, the branch has distributed 6,400 books for the children of Pottstown. Books have gone to daycare centers, family service agencies, barbershops. Hundreds went to the school districts, elementary schools. They're going to Head Start classes and pre-K classes. They're going to churches and Latino agencies. Uh, the way we see it, there's no reason Pottstown can't come to be known as reading its town around. Mm -hmm. And another thing I want to say to Borough Council, I was at a state meeting and I talked about Pottstown uh, school district and the YMCA have a program that we're supporting safety around water, something that the director, uh, Mr. Jonas Floyd, and I talked about. We starting with the school district to teach the elementary children how to swim. That mm -hmm. got high marks at our state meeting, so Pottstown is being talked about for doing something for our young people, and other chapters and other communities are looking to make Pottstown a pilot program so they can establish the same type of programs in their uh, communities. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to say to Pottstown Borough Council, Johnny Corson and the members of the NAACP, we are volunteers, but we are out supporting and promoting Pottstown, even though, like I said, we're volunteers, we don't get paid to do what we do. And I spoke at Grace Lutheran Church uh, for Black History Program, and uh, I talked about this safety around water, and one of their members came up to me and said that she taught elementary kids back in the 60s how to swim when the Y was on King Street. And I talked to Mark Gibson about this, and he told me he learned how to swim at the Y on King Street in elementary school, that he was afraid to jump off the diving board, and they threw him in the water. And that's what Mark <laughs> said. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I said that probably. But anyway, uh, one more thing. Uh, Grace Luthing has a program, uh, fourth Wednesday of the month, a diaper, a diaper bank, excuse me, where they give out diapers to families in need. They're very, uh, they need help with that. They're running out of money, and they used to do it weekly, but now they do it monthly because they can't afford it. So, Pottstown community, if you could come together and reach out to Pastor Laura Kane at uh, Grace Lutheran Church and donate diapers, baby wipes, food, formula, I think I said <laughs> that right. And lastly, uh, Bishop Mike Anthony, Heart of God Church. He's trying to do things for the young people in the community. He needs the support. So if you're interested in our young people and trying to find ways to keep our young people in a safe area, he's working with the YMCA, and I think he has uh, state police have reached out to him to help do programs for the youth in our, uh, in our community. So reach out to Bishop Mike Anthony's Church of Heart of God, and we support them also. So thank you very much, and let it be said that we need members so I can continue to do what I do, and we are promoting Pottstown and trying to put pots down on the map, and you are being spoke about highly. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes yeah. public comment. <coughs> oh <my goodness. coughs> hey, it's your turn. <coughs> Councillor Prosco, anything? I'll save it for Monday. Uh, all right. Uh, Councillor Batney. Um, just a couple of things. <coughs> to talk about the recycling center, which was awesome to go see. Um, Lids. Take off your lids unless they're big. They end up in the trash anyway. Um, it, was to it was very interesting. Don't bag your bags. I was so very guilty of this. I would put all my plastic bags in another plastic bag. It wrecks the machine. Don't do it. Loose is the best. Um, Mayor Stephanie talked about the pet loss group. Um, well, as you know, I'm an animal person. Um, I've attended one. It is really helpful, so if, if you lost a pet, um, I would highly suggest you attend a pet loss group. Um, it's good just to talk to other people that are going through the same thing. Um, I'll save that for Monday. And one more thing, um, a lot of you may know her, Julianne Wade. Uh, she's a neighbor of mine, and she tirelessly does things throughout the community and never makes a peep. And I make a lot of peeps. So most recently, she drug myself out of the house um, on a beautiful day. And we went and we took a walk in the park and we picked up trash. Bring a trash bag with you and a picker thing and go pick up trash. Um, she does it often. So I just want to acknowledge her. Um, she does a lot of good and doesn't say anything or ask for anything. And I think that's it, other than we need to continue to talk about committee times. Hmm. That's all. Okay. Council Lebedinsky. Nothing. Mm -hmm. ah. Trinita? <laughs> nope. No. <laughs> Come on. Ready. Come on.
Okay. I just wanted to make them all stay. <laughs> No, you can't go. I didn't say anything. The only thing I was going to say was I had an opportunity to work closely with you and Lisa. Oh, that's right. Okay. Oh. Okay, with regard to yeah. a situation that we had in the downtown. We and, did. And a lot of times we tend to not, uh, we tend to. Don't like each other. Yeah. That's, that's no, we just don't but agree. But we were able to um, work together. Uh -huh. No. Oh, okay. Go ahead. No. Okay. You were grown. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, we were able to work together, and uh, Ryan was extremely instrumental with with, uh, with with helping out, and and we worked closely with Justin, and we did something that we sometimes don't do enough of, which is give Justin clear direction as to what we would like to happen with this particular situation, and that was possibly one of the best things I've been able to do on council since I started here, which was work together to create. Uh, a, a to correct someone getting fined twelve thousand dollars for stickers in their window. Okay, and uh, we're going to try to see if we can stay away from the sticker That's window nice. people and maybe go towards the quality of life issues that Trinita would love to have uh, taken care of. Love. Good. Love. Do you want to kiss now? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Thank you. Thank you. It was nice to, um, even though we don't always agree to be able to talk like adults and have a conversation and come to some kind of agreement. So it was really nice to be able to work together. I agree. Oh. Okay. Councillor Kirkland, still with us? Yes, I, um, I, miss, I misspoke earlier. Uh, at the end of my uh, report, I said, uh, if you have any questions, call the borough. <laughs> Uh, I meant to say, if you have any questions, call the Ricketts Center uh, <laughs> at 484-945-1020. Okay. Thanks. Here. Nothing. Nothing. Okay. Leaves it up to me. Uh, first, I, I want to thank our commissioner, Mr. DeBella, for showing up tonight. Absolutely. It was great to have you. I, I think you're the first one here since... I can remember. I, I ain't never seen one. Yeah, I'm about to take another picture. You. I think. I, I think you're the first one here, and, and my goodness, I got to commend you for staying through this whole thing. I didn't think this, this was very short. I thought there were. A lot of <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope we entertained you, and you're, you're you're welcome back anytime. I'm hungry. Yes. Uh, and and as uh, as to the counselors, I know we all agreed last month that uh, we'd be adding a third counselor to the pre-agenda meeting, and uh, I'll, we'll have a schedule ready for Monday um, for the upcoming months. I have a That's question. all I have. When we did the rule, we didn't agree to a schedule. I verified how the rule was written. I can go back and, and check. Okay. It was just one council person. It wasn't to be appointed by anybody or any type of schedule. Yeah, we'll have one each month. No. That, so everyone should have an opportunity. That's not the way the rule is written. So I think that should be a discussion. Wait a minute. Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. It's the pre-agenda meeting that I've been going to. Mm -hmm. So when I propose that rule change, yeah. the way it is written, and I verified it with legal, that there is no specifics. It is written the way I said it. So you want to go to the meeting? For I do. Okay, well then why can't we do it? Yes, sir. So you don't want the others to participate? No, I don't get to be on many committees because of committee time, so yeah. Yeah, that'll be, can she right. be the one that... I know I ask a lot of questions, but... Meetings? No. Okay. Yes. Uh, I have nothing more, so meeting adjourned. That's what I wanted to hear. That's the what I wanted to hear.